Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Rome. We are going to cover in this and the next several lectures the complicated and often horrendous story of the dissolution of the Roman Republic. It began in 133 BC with the tribunate of Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus. And uh, which we will be covering, uh, we, we saw the movie of, uh, in our last class, and we will be covering it right now in this lecture, in the first part of this lecture, and, and the Roman Revolution will continue down to about 31 BC or so, and the Battle of Actium, which brought one man, as we will see, to power and initiated a period known as the Imperial Period in Roman history, where Rome reverted to a form of monarchical government under the emperors. Therefore, we can see right from the start that the Roman Revolution, unlike many modern concepts of revolutions, was somewhat different. It was not a planned event like, say, the Russian Revolution or the French Revolution, enacted for ideological reasons, uh, nor was it restricted uh, to a brief catastrophic period of activity like those that I've just mentioned. It was rather a long, drawn-out, protracted spiral of disorder. And this is because, as we have seen, the so-called constitution of the Roman Republic, the most maiorum, as the Romans called it, the way of the ancestors, was just that. It was an assemblage of accepted practices and patterns of behavior that allowed the Romans to govern the state in the way that they did. And it was not a, 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 a document that spelled out exactly you know, the, the laws behind all of these institutions, the legal potentialities of this or that office were not at the core of the Roman system of government. Rather, it was a pattern of behavior um, agreed upon for those holding office, uh, which was at the core of the Roman Republic. And so the Roman Revolution evolved uh, as a series of events in domestic and foreign affairs that built upon each other in a sequence of precedents that cumulatively had the effect of destroying the state. It isn't really any one or other of these events that is decisive. It is rather the cumulative snowball effect of the whole period that brings the Roman Republic to an end. So it is therefore a complicated story, and I hope to guide you through it with the maximum degree of clarity as best I can. We will often be seeing an inter interaction of domestic and foreign affairs. Our main focus will be on the domestic results of this interaction, but we will have occasionally to divert our attention uh, to the provinces of the Roman Empire where events were taking place that were to impinge on the course of the Roman Revolution. So to begin with, the starting point of the Roman Revolution is clear to us. That is, the it is the tribunate of one, in 133 BC, of the man you see in front of you, Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus. This man was of a plebeian family, but definitely a member of that new nobility in the Roman Senate that I have talked about before. His father had, of the same exact name, actually, Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, had been a prominent uh, man, twice consul, and then had served the state with a degree of eminence. Uh, the younger Gracchus, who, you, who we're talking about right now, as a young nobleman, was therefore already on the road to a prominent political career himself. Our Gracchus was aware of the problem that we looked at uh, in our last lecture that was afflicting the Italian countryside and impacting on the issue of manpower in the Roman army, namely the decline of the small holder in the Roman countryside and his replacement by large estates owned by rich senators and sometimes equestrians um, who then employed uh, gangs of, of large gangs of slaves to work the land. Gracchus determined that he would fix this problem, and when he became tribune of the plebs in 133 BC, he proposed a land reform bill which aimed at fixing this problem. Now, in forcing this bill through against heated opposition, he initiated the beginning of what modern historians call the Roman Revolution. He did so unwittingly. And that is a really important point to make. He, did, he was not a Lenin-like figure who deliberately set out to overthrow the state. Nevertheless, the events of the first six months of 133 BC 
warrant close inspection because they are the pivotal ones that gets this entire tragic story uh, moving. Well, the first thing to note is that Gracchus's bill was not terribly revolutionary in and of itself. It focused on what was known in Latin as agere publicus, or public land, which was to say that land in Italy, which the Romans had taken control of as they expanded their state, and which was not assigned to one or another of the subject peoples. It was just kind of out there. And this, there's actually a, a very strong analogy for this type of land in British history. If you've studied uh, European history, you'll know that uh, in England and in other parts of the, of the, of the continent, uh, there were these public lands that would, would be, be um, you know, used for um, grazing for animals and stuff like that for, uh, for, you know, for the common people that were not exactly, that were not specifically owned by wealthy landowners. Well, this public land had been gobbled up, basically, by these um, wealthy, you know, latifundia, these broad farms that we've talked about last time. And, um, and that was contrary to the, to the law, because the entire Roman people were technically the owners of this agere publicus, this public law. This was according to a law passed in 367 BC, which stated that there was a limit on how much of this type of land any one private citizen could own. And the limit in Roman terms was 500 yugera. And that, a yugera is a bit smaller than an English acre. So 500 yugera is the, is the equivalent to uh, about 320 acres of land. That is still a very large piece of land, I should just say. Okay, for one person to own 320 acres is still massive. And this law had been on the books since the mid fourth century, as I said, but it had been basically ignored. People had simply not paid attention to it. And as a result, large amounts of public land were in the hands of these very rich landowners, far beyond the legally prescribed limit. So what R. Gracchus proposed to do with his land reform bill was to enforce that law. That was really all there was. It was simply to revive that original law and to do so, he proposed that citizens who held excessive amounts of public land, these rich, wealthy latifundia owners, um, those who had a surplus beyond the 500 yugera limit, that their land should be confiscated. And that that surplus land, which had been confiscated, should then be redistributed to the landless masses, the dispossessed smallholders who were accumulating in numbers in Rome as members of the Capitacensi, the landless headcount. <clears throat> now, obviously, this law would have certainly been a disadvantage to those rich, wealthy landowners. People would lose tracts of land that, um, as I mentioned in the film that, that uh, we hopefully watched last class, had been in their family by this point, perhaps even for generations. But on the other hand, the intentions of this law were clearly honorable, and patriotic senators and noblemen were um, in support of it. Uh, you know, as, as you saw in the movie, Gracchus's own father-in-law, uh, uh, Publius Clodius Pulcher, uh, he was very much in support of this, of this land redistribution bill, and he was a very old, blue-blooded member of the Senate. And there were others as well. So it did have certain people that were in support of it, even among the landed gentry. In addition, Gracchus had eminent support in the Senate. Um, he was a very well-connected person. Um, as I said, his father had been a very prominent man. His father-in-law, uh, Publius Clodius Pulcher, was actually what, what in Latin is called the princeps senatus, which is basically the equivalent of the Speaker of the House, the oldest living senator who had the right of speaking first on all issues. Uh, his mother was the daughter of Scipio Africanus, the defeater of Hannibal. He can't get much more illustrious than that. Uh, and he was well uh, connected and had plenty of noble relations that he could call upon for support. His brother-in-law was, uh, was um, Scipio Aemilianus, the, the defeater of the, the conqueror of the city of Carthage, the sacker of Carthage. And so he did have plenty of connections uh, and power bases that he could call upon for support. That's how Roman politics worked, really, was that, you know, you had your network uh, and, uh, and you could, you know, kind of, you know, 
exert influence by the, through by means of that network. Well, the normal course of events would have been for Tiberius to bring his bill first before the Senate for discussion, with and then they would issue, you recall, their senatus consultum, their, their issuance of a decree or a piece of advice. Then that piece of advice from the Senate would be taken to the people for, uh, for a vote uh, before the tribunes of the plebs, and then, then it would be enacted as a law. Before looking at the actual course of events which took place, I'll just mention that one of the issues that has greatly focused the attention of scholars in the, really throughout the, the whole modern span of scholarship on Roman history from the 19th century onwards, is the question of Tiberius's motives. What motivated him to take on this job of land reform? There are those who argue that Tiberius was a genuine altruistic reformer. Uh, my wife, who grew up in the former Soviet Union, um, uh, tells me, and I've heard this from elsewhere, actually, too, that in the Soviet Union, because of the Marxist principle that all history is the history of class struggle, Tiberius Gracchus was looked at as kind of a proto-communist. Um, that, uh, you know, here we have this guy trying to take away the land of the rich and redistribute it to the poor. Now, that's, of course, total nonsense. Uh, there were no communists in ancient Rome. Um, but... You can see, though, you know, at least why they perhaps would have reinterpreted him in, the, in those lights. Um, and there, of course, there are those who argue just in the opposite direction um, and that it would see him basically as being a total revolutionary, working for his own benefit, you know, using populism as a means of garnering uh, power for himself. And we, of course, can, uh, can see exactly that sort of thing having occurred in, in, in recent years in America, and indeed throughout, uh, throughout much of uh, Europe and, and other parts of the world. So there are these two very different ways of looking at them. I, for my part, um, you know, I like to always just be, basically disagree with everybody, <laughs> but I, for my part, uh, am attracted in some ways to Tiberius Gracchus. I do see him as being basically a good guy, a person with some sense of genuine, um, you know, uh, motivations for a genuine reform for the state, which he saw badly needed it. But at the same time, though, there's absolutely no reason that, you know, given the complexity of human nature, that those good motives can't coexist along side by side with, you know, the obvious personal um, uh, power that would accrue to him because of these uh, reforms and, you know, the fact that, um, you know, he, uh, as all Roman politicians were, he was no doubt ambitious as well. So I, I, I see him in kind of a more of a mixed light in that regard. Well, all the people to whom land was distributed by Tiberius Gracchus obviously would become clients of Tiberius Gracchus and his family, and he could, could not have been unaware of this. So, um, you know, you can see that why he has been painted in widely different ways. But it, it is point. It is important to mention. That, you know, this there is this kind of tertium quid. There is this third possibility. There is no reason why such motives are not mutually. Uh, do, do, well, such motives are not um, capable of being side by side with one another. And that is something I'll draw your attention to in both modern and ancient commentaries. Uh, thinkers about Tiberius uh, alike. They both have come to very different uh, positions as to what his motives were. And if you go further in your own study of Roman history, you will see that there is much discussion of this issue. Well, now to return to the sequence of events of, in the year 133, Tiberius should have taken his proposal to the Senate, but he didn't. This was the thing that really ticked them off. He bypassed the Senate. He took his bill, rather, um, as was his right, because he was a tribune of the, of the people, he took his bill directly to the tribal assembly of the plebs. There had been certain precedents for such behavior. Tribunes could take certain types of bills to their assembly without going to the, to the Senate. But for a bill that would be this contentious and which would disadvantage many of those white shoe boys who were members of the Senate, this was definitely an inflammatory act. And for whatever reason, Tiberius did it. He bypassed the Senate. The Senate therefore responded with a clever ploy. They contracted one of Tiberius's tribunal colleagues, Marcus Octavius. Remember that there were 10 tribunes every year. And they contracted him basically, took him out to lunch and basically said, we can make a real career for you, boy, if you just play along with us and veto Tiberius's bill. And he did so. Now this would have ended the bill and killed it dead in its tracks. But at this point, 
I'm sorry, at this point, by the normal standards of behavior in the Roman Republic, Gracchus, having been vetoed, should have just backed down. Okay, he should have seen the strength of opposition and the veto of his colleague and simply backed down, but he didn't. He entreated Octavius to withdraw his veto. Remember, all of this is taking place in person with all 10 tribunes on the speaker's platform in the forum with the mob right there in front of them watching, you know, uh, yelling, you know, uh, you know, gesticulating, all sorts, you know, you name it. It's all very public. It's almost like political theater. Well, Tiberius Gracchus, we hear, entreated Octavius with tears in his eyes. We hear him clasping at his knees, even saying, please withdraw your veto. Octavius refused. Tiberius then said, well then, you should resign your tribunate, since you are no longer acting in the interests of the people, and that is your mandate as a tribune of the people. Octavius refused, and Tiberius said, we will meet again, and he dissolved the assembly for that day. He called another assembly, though, some days hence, at which he proposed a, uh, to the people a bill that would depose Marcus Octavius from his tribunate by order of the people on the argument that he was no longer a tribune of the plebs as he was acting against their interests. A very dramatic scene ensued. Remember, voting proceeded by tribal units, 35 of them in this particular assembly, and it would stop voting when a majority of 18 was reached. Well, voting proceeded, 17 tribes voting for the depo deposition of Marcus Octavius. Tiberius though called a halt to the proceedings and entreated Octavius one last time to withdraw his veto before the last vote was taken. Octavius again, now we hear with tears in his eyes, looked at Tiberius and then looked up at that solid mass of senators looking down upon the proceedings from outside the Senate House. Remember, I showed you in that picture from last time that they were higher. You see, they were like physically above the tribunes, looking down upon them. And he looked up at them, at that solid mass of senators looking down on the proceedings outside the Senate House. And here were his masters. And he knew that he could not say no to them. And he refused to withdraw his veto. Well, the voting proceeded, and Octavius was indeed deposed from his tribunate and dragged ignominiously from the speaker's platform. Now, this was a shocking act, without press, totally without precedent in the Roman state. Never before had this ever been done. Tiberius Gracchus, in deposing Octavius, had undermined one of the core principles of Roman office holding, you remember, collegiality. You always had to have a colleague who could veto your proceedings. The idea of ousting or deposing a colleague who vetoed your proceedings had not even been thought of before and was distinctly revolutionary. Gracchus's land bill though, now with the veto removed, was passed into law. The Senate had its hands though on the purse strings of the Roman state and therefore they came up with a new ploy. They, fine, you have your law now, Tiberius, but we will refuse to fund this bill. You see, the bill would have required a board of three men to travel around all of Italy, which is a lot larger than you think. And, um, and of course, you remember that Roman magistrates had to carry out all of their actions in person. So this would have meant that, um, that the people that Tiberius Gracchus and his colleagues had put on for the, this land commission were to travel around Italy and to survey the land, okay, with surveying instruments. Uh, measuring each of these parcels of land into 500 yugura each, and then re, you know, going on to the next parcel, putting the, divide, the, the stones in place. And it would have been, you know, it, it would have had a, taken a long time, a lot of money to hire people to do this. Uh, and then they would, of course, then the actual redistributions could take place. Well, the Senate voted uh, not to give them any money. They gave them a little bit. It was a pittance. Uh, it was, you know, like something like, 10 cents a day or something like that but um uh but but basically they basically they they said they denied them any money okay so that okay his law had been passed but now he did he doesn't have any money to see it actually enacted it would have died at that moment but then a most unpredicted event unpredictable event happened at this point historical contingency comes into play they had reached an impasse, Tiberius and the Senate, 
and it looked like the bill, the, la the law now was not going anywhere. But then all of a sudden, news came from Asia, that is from Asia Minor, from Turkey, that King Attalus of the kingdom of Pergamum, which is this kind of smallish kingdom in the Hellenistic East, King Attalus of Pergamum had died childless and left his kingdom of Pergamum, which is very rich, even though I say it's smallish, it's still very large, you know, uh, it just wasn't huge the way that the other three major Hellenistic monarchies were, but still large and rich. Uh, basically, it was the northwestern part of Turkey. Um, he left this entire kingdom to the Romans as a gift of Rome, a gift to Rome. Uh, and, the, and it could now become a new province, the province of Asia. All of a sudden now, Tiberius pounced. He proposed a bill to the people that the money, the new income from this huge windfall that just came into the Roman state, be diverted to fund his land commission. And it passed. Therefore, in one stroke, he insinuated the mob into the two unchallenged areas of senatorial dominance, you recall, financial affairs and foreign affairs. Okay, so he's, he's basically just sticking both fingers in the eyes of the Senate. The land commission therefore proceeded and began to do its work. Tiberius, however, was not yet finished because now he figured there wasn't enough time left in his tribunate year to oversee the implementation of his bill. He let it be known, therefore, that he would stand for a second tribunate for the following year of 132 BC. He therefore was now attacking the other core principle of office holding at Rome, that is limited tenure of office, right? You always had one year in office and then you could maybe run again for that same office like 10, 15 years later. But the idea of doing one and then another one right afterwards, completely revolutionary. The perception could now therefore be drawn from Tiberius's actions that he was aiming at nothing less than demagoguery, tyranny of the people. And if you were a Roman nobleman, you can see how this perception would be quite clear. If you were a member of the Senate, you would see now this guy is not uh, playing around. Um, you know, uh, we've now got, you know, tribunes uh, lording their power over the people, passing laws, ignoring the Senate, tribunes deposing other tribunes who veto them, tribunes who can be reelected indefinitely every year. We are looking at a tyranny, they said to themselves tensions were running high indeed. At a political rally on the Capitol Hill, Tiberius Gracchus and his followers were gathering to discuss the strategy of the elections which would take place in the summer, uh, in, uh, in July to be specific, of that year. Senatorial spies were watching the proceedings. The Senate was in session waiting for news. Uh, and at one point, the crowd surged and Tiberius Gracchus felt himself under some pressure. He felt endangered and therefore he raised his hand to his head as an agreed upon sign that he had given to his aides uh, to indicate that he was feeling some danger and that he needed to move in. They needed to move in and kind of help sort of do crowd control. But this gesture of raising his hand to his head, the senatorial spies read, as a, as, as, um, well, they read it differently. <laughs> and they ran down to the Senate and informed the senators that at this very moment, Tiberius Gracchus was calling for a crown. Okay. He was now telling the people that he wanted to be crowned king. Now, you remember the word king was a veritable curse word in the Roman political vocabulary. Their whole idea of libertas was freedom meaning equality with the other senators and with the other noblemen in the state, and that you ne no one man could ever have supreme power. Therefore, the senators en masse, horrified at the prospect of a return to monarchy, rushed forward from the Senate House, broke up some of the benches that were traditionally used as part of the gatherings of political meetings, and with, with the bench legs, they beat Tiberius Gracchus and 300 of his followers to death. Gracchus's body was not given a decent burial, but rather it was thrown like that of a common criminal into the Tiber River. Whatever the motives 
of Tiberius Gracchus, his legacy to the Roman Republic was absolutely appalling. For he had utterly transgressed all of the boundaries of accepted behavior in the course of his tribunate. And this is all in the space of less than six months, you remember. He had refused to back down in the face of opposition, transgressing this most important concept of concordia or harmony, maintaining harmony in the state between its various different uh, uh, parts and you know legislative bodies and ruling bodies, classes, all of those different you know multitudes of diversity that make up a society. Concordia is this kind of divine principle that keeps the, all of those things in harmony. He had broken all of that. He had deposed an opposing colleague. He had insinuated the mob into the traditional preserves of senatorial governance and finances and foreign affairs. He had undermined the concept of limited tenure of office by proposing to stand for the tribunate of the following year. And worse than that, senators themselves had left a dreadful precedent for the future. Um, in, the, <clears throat> uh, in the fact that they directly introduced d violence into domestic political dispute by, disputes by killing one of their own opponents. This would, would have the worst possible uh, ramifications in the coming decades. And these two legacies of breaking the constitutional order and also direct ejection of violence into political affairs, these two legacies are the two most pronounced from Tiberius Gracchus's tribune. A new way forward was pointed for ambitious politicians. Use the people use tribunes and the tribal assembly of the plebs to advance your case and or even worse to kill your political opponents and once introduced into roman politics violence in particular was not to leave for over a century in the years following tiberius gracchus's tri tribunate the land commission did its work unopposed clearly a sign that the Senate was really more horrified and appalled at Tiberius Gracchus's methods than actually at the proposed land bill itself, which, as I've said before, was really not that revolutionary. It was really, it was just his methods that were so revolutionary. It seems that it was actually this land commission was doing its work well since census figures for these years preserved in Livy indicate that the number of citizens with land increased in the following years, and that is in the years following 133. Precisely 10 years after the introduction of Tiberius's land bill in 123 BC, and then again in 122 BC, trouble erupted, however, in the Roman state. And for a second time, a Gracchus was once more at the heart of it. This was Gaius Sempronius Gracchus, the younger brother of Tiberius. Yes, there are two of them. <laughs> that is why in history books, we always refer to the Gracchi in the plural. Okay, that's how you pronounce the Gracchi. Obviously, with no love of the Senate, uh, he was seething with vengeance against the very people who had murdered his brother. Gaius Sempronius Gracchus became tribune of the people in 123 BC and again in 122. And uh, it must be stated that in the interim, in that 10 year period, a law had been passed allowing people to stand for successive tribunates within reason. Uh, okay, so you could, it, it was no longer revolutionary to do that. A very, very um, early indication of the way things would work here is that, you know, so you have something that happens at first in a revolutionary fashion, and then afterwards, the, the very fact that it happened at all sets a precedent for the future. That's very much how the Romans view the political machinery, the political apparatus of their state is that it's all about precedent. It's all about if you could look back and see something that was ever done in such and such a manner, then it could be done again. Um, uh, no, it, it didn't mean that you could keep on going for a decade or more in the same office. No, no, no. Uh, but you could hold one, two, maybe even three uh, tribunates if you wished. Okay. Well, Gaius Gracchus is a more difficult figure in some ways than his brother. Uh, Tiberius was motivated by the single issue that he cleaved to and forced through as best he could. But Gaius Gracchus uh, was not, such, it was not uh, so simple. During his tribune, he passed a whole wide range of bills on a variety of different matters. He appears to have been a, even more of a firebrand than his brother, more openly anti-senatorial. 
We hear, for instance, that at political meetings, he was the first one who would address the people, turning his back on the Senate rather than facing the Senate. Obviously a symbolic move. He was an extremely emotional and powerful public orator and could rouse up support for himself in a variety of ways. Um, in, other way, in other words, he was even more of an open demagogue than Tiberius had been. His legislation, which we don't have to go into in detail, there's just simply too much of it, uh, so far as we can make it out, seems to have been aimed at garnering as much support as he could for himself from a variety of different sources. So he proposed laws uh, that would benefit the mob. Uh, he also proposed, for instance, he proposed that, that grain be given at a much reduced price to the people, uh, grain that would be sold to the mob below market price, kind of like a, almost like a food stamps kind of, kind of thing. But of course, this would, you know, for the urban proletariat, this would have been a, uh, uh, a very popular move. Uh, he proposed various roads and building works to give the people uh, employment. He also proposed the founding of overseas colonies. One of the places, interestingly enough, that he wanted to found actually a, a colony in was Carthage. Uh, which had been sitting vacant since 146 BC. Uh, and uh, it was an extremely excellent site for a city. The Romans um, weren't silly. They saw the advantages of that site. Um, and, but it actually would not be made into a, um, into a colony until Julius Caesar about 100 years later. Um, but he did propose to found colonies overseas and to help the landless of the city in some way or another. In a series of samples of the sorts of legislation that Gaius Gracchus issued, besides the ones I've just mentioned, um, he also um, seems to have wanted to somehow pit the equestrian class, that night, that second kind of tier uh, aristocracy, against the senatorial aristocracy. So he proposed various fiscal measures that, that benefited the equestrian class in their commercial enterprises and also proposed to give them some political power for the first time, uh, for instance, by giving them power over extortion courts. Now, this is a very, this may not seem like a big deal at first, but it is. Extortion courts were those courts established to scrutinize the behavior of governors, proconsuls, and proprietors who were all senators, right? When you're, after your year in, in, as consul or praetor was over, you then could go get a governorship, a proprietorship, a proconsulship in some province. You could then bleed it dry by extorting money out of the people in that province um, and, uh, and then go back home and, and just live it up for the rest of your life. Well, he proposed now to give the, uh, ordinarily uh, up until him, up until Gaius Gracchus, those courts were, ruled, were presided over by Equestrian, I'm sorry, by senators. So it was kind of like the, you know, the, the fox watching the hen house. Uh, you have other white shoe boys uh, hearing the extortion trials of their friends. Obviously, they're almost never going to find them guilty. Um, maybe on the rare occasion, if one of them was a personal enemy of the other, uh, you know, maybe something like that. But for the most part, the provincials were being bled dry, and the senators were getting away with it just fine. So he gave the uh, the the uh, judge uh, positions of those trials over not to the senators but took them away from the senators and gave them to the equestrians. So now you have a people who are um, they don't have a political axe to grind and they actually don't even have a kind of history of public service in any capacity. Now overseeing people, maybe they didn't get along with certain people. Uh, maybe they're, you know so much of Roman politics comes down to personal enmities, personal friendships. Um, but the effect of it though, and he even said this himself on one occasion, he said, by doing so, I have thrown daggers into the forum. That's the way he put it. In other words, he was kind of deliberately pitting one aspect of the aristocracy against another. And um, and giving the equestrian class a political stick to wield over the senators. Um, and therefore it became precisely over this area of provincial affairs that senators and knights found themselves most at loggerheads. Knights, remember, were the ones in, char in charge of tax farming in the provinces. And the senators were the ones in charge of maintaining the, the order of the, as governors of the province. And so, by excessive extortion, the tax farming uh, of, by, done by the knights, um, uh, you know, could have, could bring disorder to the provinces. But now, uh, here you have uh, th those same people now to basically being in charge of of overseeing any of those things and being able to kick out or bring up on charges any governor that stood in their way. 
Um, so Gracchus was proposing that, that uh, it would be the publicani basically who would sit in judgment of the future governors uh, who, were, who had been charged with extortion in the provinces. And this gave them a bit of big political stick to beat the Senate with. And these measures seems to have, to have uh, been designed to garner the support of the, of the Knights. Gaius, Tiberius, uh, Gaius and Primus Gracchus also proposed or seemed to be going uh, to the Italian allies as a further basis for his support. Remember, there were still many parts of Italy where people were not full Roman citizens, but were just simply Italian allies. Uh, and the issue of, the, of rights for the Italian allies, especially the enfranchisement of the Italian allies, making them full citizens, became a heated uh, matter in the course of the 120s. Many Italian allies felt that they had done their due, expanding the Roman Empire. They had fought. Remember, 50% of all, Italian, uh, all Roman armies were made up of Italian allies. They had felt that they had performed sufficiently for Rome and now deserved to be fully enfranchised as Roman citizens. The Roman people seemed to have changed in their attitude toward sharing citizenship in the, around this time, and they guarded it more zealously uh, than they had before. They were unwilling to support the allies in this bid for citizenship. Therefore, when Gaius Gracchus proposed the enfranchisement of all states that had Latin rights, he made himself unpopular, it seems, with the mob of citizens in Rome. He seemed clearly to have been aiming at garnering maybe wider support. He had done things to, to appease the mob, but now they had, he, and he was kind of making them angry at him. Presumably, if all of those allies, of course, had become voting citizens, they would have voted for Gracchus. So the Senate this time did not try to veto Gracchus's reform. They tried a different tactic. For the year 121, Marcus Livius Drusus became a tribune of the plebs. Rather than voting Gaius Gracchus, uh, Gaius Gracchus's, uh, sorry, vetoing Gaius Gracchus's various measures, the Senate simply outbid him for popularity. So what they did was they put Marcus Livius Drusus up to be even more of a populist than Gracchus had been. So why have cheap grain, said Drusus, when you could have free grain? Why have a handful of colonies across the ocean when you can have a dozen of them here in Italy itself? You won't even have to travel that far from home. He realized that the issue of the enfranchisement of the Allies was unpopular with the mob, and he did not outbid Gracchus at that, but rather proposed some, some other modifying measures that the Allies be treated better in the army and not be subject to summary beatings as they had been to that time. And all, put it all together, he attempted to undermine Gracchus's popularity with the various sectors of the mob and of, of, of the broader spe uh, spectrum of society, which Gracchus ha was trying to garner for himself. And it worked. The mob deserted Gaius Gracchus, especially over the issue of enfranchisement over the Allies. He became less popular, and although he had been elected as tribune of the plebs in these two years, he failed, to, uh, that is 123 and 122, he failed to gain election as tribune of the plebs for 121. Tensions now mounted. Gracchus now would undoubtedly be facing prosecution for his behavior. His political enemies would be attempting to pounce on him the moment that he was out of office, because this is an issue that the Romans had um, uh, uh, had no doubt about, unlike uh, in modern countries. A sitting magistrate was not liable to prosecution. Uh, but as soon as that magistracy ended, as soon as it lapsed, he was, therefore, uh, liable to prosecution. And we will see this issue arising again and again, especially regarding Julius Caesar. So the situation toward the end of 122 BC and into 122, 121 gets very tense. Gracchus took to being escorted around the city by a surreptitiously armed bodyguard. Uh, you remember it was illegal to carry weapons inside of the city of Rome, uh, but you could carry pens, okay, styli. And a Roman pen, a stylus, um, was essentially a narrow spike made out of iron. Um, uh, sometimes it was made out of ivory, but mo most of the time out of metal, with a flat tip on one end for, um, uh, for erasure and kind of a sharpened tip on the other end for actually carving onto wax tablets. 
and they would make effective weapons. That's the sum total of my point here. And so Gracchus had his guards armed in this fashion, carrying around these very large styli. At a political rally for Gracchus, when tensions were running high, one of the slaves of the consul for that year, a man named Gaius Opimius, issued an insult in the direction of Gracchus's supporters. We hear that Gaius Gracchus cast him an evil glance. At one point, some of Gracchus's supporters took that evil glance as a sign that they should act. And they came up to that man and murdered him, stabbed him to death. Uh, it was a slave. Now, the consul, Gaius Epimius, now saw fit to act. As soon as word got back to him that, that, Gai, that Gracchus's supporters had just stabbed a man to death, albeit a slave, in, in the street, he proposed immediately that Gracchus be considered a revolutionary. He argued the Senate should act promptly before they faced a tyranny. For the first time in Roman history, the Senate passed a decree known as the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, the ultimate decree of the Senate. It essentially was just one sentence that they gave power to Gaius Epimius, the consul, to see to it that the Republic receive no harm. It is essentially martial law. He could do whatever he wanted to. It ordered the consuls to do whatever it took to maintain order and to preserve the liberty of the state. The consul Gaius Epimius armed his personal attendants and slaves, and especially a uh, kind of like a kind of like a bodyguard, you know, his lictors, but you know, all of them with weapons. And a full-scale riot broke out in the center of Rome, street fighting in which Gaius Gracchus himself was decapitated and no less than 3,000 of his followers were all killed. Gaius Gracchus followed his brother down the Tiber. The legacy, therefore, of the Gracchi brothers was an appalling one. The situation in Rome, the old accepted consensus of patterns of behavior had been washed away completely. They had challenged the authority of the Senate. And we will see at the beginning of the next section that we're going to look at right now, how this became, uh, how this came into a, uh, to a degree, became crystallized in Roman politics in the following decades. They had indicated a new route, these, the Gracchi had indicated a new route to power for the ambitious young politician. The tribal assembly of the plebs, led by ambitious, able, firebrand tribunes, uh, was now going to be the path forward for young men who wanted to arri arrive at power in Rome. The Gracchi had paid a heavy price for challenging the Senate's authority. On both occasions, the Senate had set the worst precedent, however, for on both occasions, it was the Senate who had resorted to violence, and it was violence that was to be the ultimate undoing of the Roman Republic. And we're going to see, basically, as a theme for the whole rest of the Roman Revolution, this, these two sides jockeying back and forth for power. There's the kind of populist side, the mob, or people who are using the mob to gain power, and then the Senate trying to wrest that power back again for themselves into the more conservative or aristocratic side. We don't, definitely don't want to make any modern comparisons, Democrat versus Republican or anything like that. <clears throat> even, even, even the whole Marxist critique of all history being class warfare, even that falls apart too, because the, all of these politicians, including the Gracchi, were all aristocrats. So even a popularist, as well as a populist kind of politician is is just a different methodology as opposed to the senatorial ones which are you know they they, they support the old way of doing things as opposed to the the, the populists who you know um take this new route but now though we have embarked on our analysis of the roman revolution and a term which i will just remind you again was coined by modern scholars not applied to the period by the Romans themselves, but coined by modern scholars to describe this period we are examining of increasing disorder and violence in the Roman state. And we've seen how the beginnings of this process with the tribunates of Tiberius and then Gaius Gracchus in 133, and then ultimately uh, ending in 121, um, uh, set this, this whole ball in motion. And what I want to do right now is pick up the tale uh, 10 or so years after the death of Gaius Gracchus in 121. The intervening years between 121 and, say, 111, 
uh, were relatively quiet. It, was seen, it would seem that the mob was cowed in some ways. The events that, um, uh, you know, that, that took place in, around the death of him, killing 3,000 people, citizens in the city of Rome, uh, that will definitely keep the plebs in their, in their place for a long time. But ultimately, though, um, events would g- get underway uh, around 111 or so, which were to start the rise and uh, a rise to power of the next major protagonist in the process of dissolution of the Roman Senate, of the Roman Republic, and that is Gaius Marius. We will look at the careers of Marius and then of Lucius Cornelius Sulla, who is his worst antagonist. We will see how their careers overlapped, and we will look at them, each of them in turn. Before we do that, though, I want to emphasize a general point about what had happened in Roman politics as a result of the careers of the Gracchi brothers. For we saw that the major legacies of the Gracchi brothers in Roman politics was the, was the pointing of a new way of doing things for the ambitious young nobleman, namely the use of tribunes of the plebs, taking bills directly to the tribal assembly of the plebs, the Concilium plebis, to get legislation enacted and to affect a political agenda. And this new route was followed in the years following the Gracchi brothers to the degree that it was recognized by the Romans themselves as a method of doing politics. And in fact, the Romans even had a name for this, or a phrase that they coined for this. They called this process populariter agare, that is to behave in a populist way, a way that appeals to the people. And they called the men who did this, who populariter agare, uh, they called them men of the people or populares, populists would be the proper way to pronounce, the proper way to translate that, populares. The men of the people, the populists were in opposition to the more conservative element in the Senate who looked to the older way, the more traditional ways of running the state, primarily with the Senate as the dominant body. These men, uh, abrogated the, um, or I should say, arrogated the uh, the term the best ones for themselves. They called themselves the optimates, uh, which simply is the Latin way to basically say what in Greek is called the aristocrats. But the, it means the, 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 both words mean the same thing: the best men. I want to stress, though, again, that these are not political parties in the modern sense. The closest thing you might have is maybe parties in the, say, the 19th century British sense of, you know, kind of, <clears throat> there is a degree of ideological division between them, but it is not really a division founded in any theory or firmly rooted in any ideology. It was more a division based on methods. Uh, which route did you take? Uh, do you take the traditional route of applying uh, through the Senate and using the influence of the chief men of the state and respecting their, you know, venerable, you know, old wisdom as gathered in the Senate? Or do you take your, you know, take the new route of going straight to the people as a tribune or using a tribune? You did not necessarily have to be a tribune yourself. And this is interesting, but you could use a tribune to access the legislative power of the tribal assembly of the plebs directly. Populares tended to strike a certain pose also. Uh, they would propose legislation that would be popular for the people. Uh, they would often denigrate the Senate as an institution and pose as champions of the people. Uh, whether or not they actually genuinely felt that way, of course, is totally up for debate. Uh, they certainly are not left-wing communists or revolutionaries who are trying to overturn the state or create some kind of egalitarian utopia, nothing like that. Really, it's a division between the populares and the optimates in terms of methodology. And we will see this again and again as the Roman Revolution proceeds. So getting back to the man I just introduced you to a moment ago, Gaius Marius was a new man in Latin, a novus homo. From, uh, that is, he was the first person in his family to, uh, to attain the higher offices of the state. He could not look back in his family tree and see any people who were praetors or consuls or anything like that. Um, he was, from what the Roman established nobility would have thought, the Styx, the country backwoods. It was the town of Arpinum in Italy. Uh, it's actually not that far from Rome. It's only several hours away by train, but still, though, it was, it was the hinterland for the Romans. Um, 
he seems to have had a connection with the major Roman family of the Caecilii Metelli, who were a leading family in Rome and may have been the patrons of Marius's family. His early career was lackluster in the extreme. He didn't seem to be going anywhere in particular, in fact. He got elected to some offices, failed, though, to be elected to the ideal ship, and only barely got in as a praetor in 115 BC. He was really a very mediocre-looking man and kind of a nobody in that year, 115. However, in that year, nobody would have thought that this man was going to be anything of particular prominence. But something happened. Marius chose, you see, the military route, which was one of the chief avenues, the fast tracks to prominence in the Roman Republic. He chose the military route for himself and saw his opportunity in Numidia. The kingdom of Numidia, broadly speaking, is the equivalent of modern day Algeria and northern Africa, and it had come under the wing of Rome during the Second Punic War. In Numidia, in 111 BC, a war broke out due to internal dynastic machinations that don't concern us at all, but a king of Numidia named Jugurtha believed in a way that was contrary to various, I'm sorry, behaved in a way that was contrary to various decrees of the Senate and the wishes of the Roman people. And Jugurtha, through a combination of military cleverness and general elusiveness in the field and massive acts of bribery, eluded the capture of Rome. Basically what happened was this. Jugurtha was the half uh, brother of two of the princes of Numidia. And when their father died, the two princes didn't look at Jugurtha as really worthy of sharing uh, the kingdom with because he was only a half brother. And so Jugurtha did the only sensible thing and he had one of them killed immediately. Uh, he, he besieged him inside of a city and he had the whole city basically uh, raised to the ground and killed. And unfortunately in that city were some Roman citizens. They were merchants who were traders. And um, the, the, uh, uh, now this, or, ordinarily this could have just been all blown over. Jugurtha could have come to Rome and made some excuses and you know, made some apologies in the usual way and, and everything would have been okay. But because there was still this um, kind of big pall hanging over the Roman state because of everything that had happened with the Gracchi 10 years earlier, not even 10 years earlier at this point. Um, Oh, you have all of these common people saying, look, you Roman nobles, you know, you, you're all good about killing us whenever you, uh, whenever we get out of line, like you did with the Gracchi. But, um, but when it comes to avenging our, you know, one of ours, when it's been killed by this barbarian, uh, you don't have anything to do with it. So they put so much, they were agitating so much. The Romans had to do something about it. And Jugurtha was such a clever person. He was able to elude all of the various different Roman uh, generals that were sent out against him, as I said, either through military victory or through kind of elusiveness, just dodging them and getting them lost in the rough North African terrain, or actually through massive acts of bribery. Um, ultimately, uh, his other brother who survived went to Rome and pled before the Senate and asked them to help him out. Jugurtha was called to Rome to speak his case. And when he went to Rome to plead his case, he is reported on, he bribed so many people <laughs> inside of Rome um, that he is reported on as he was leaving the city to have said the words to have, in the effect that as he looked at Rome, there is a city in which everything and everyone is for sale and it is doomed to perish as soon as it finds a buyer. Um, well, so he drags on this war until 111 BC for four years, in other words. At which point, Marius, who was serving as a minor officer in this war in Numidia, figured that he knew what he could do to bring it to a swift end, and he stood and for and was elected to the consulship in 107 BC on precisely the promise to the people, to the commoners, I will bring you Jugurtha's head on a plate, basically. He didn't quite end it in one year. It took him two years, but he did do a swift job on Jugurtha. Jugurtha was cornered, defeated, and eventually physically captured alive and brought to Rome in 105 BC. Where, um, and then he was paraded through the streets and then strangled in the Tullianum, this kind of prison that, uh, dungeon that, that you can still go and visit to this day. It is where St. Peter was. 
it is a shrine uh, now, but uh, you can still see this most ghastly place where condemned prisoners would have been held from ancient times. Um, Marius, therefore, uh, was the leading man in Rome. He was basically, people couldn't get enough of him. They thought he was just the best thing in two shoes uh, and was elected as a consul in 105 BC, now for the second time. Uh, uh, this was this was ultimately to complete the war. I kind of got a little ahead of myself there. Uh, Jugurtha ultimately was only captured actually by uh, a neighboring king. He was kind of kidnapped by a neighboring king named King Bocchus of Mauritania, wonderful name. Um, Mauritania is essentially modern day Morocco. Bocchus handed Jugurtha over to one of Marius's officers, not Marius himself, a quaestor serving in Marius's army in 105, a man named Lucius Cornelius Sulla. The, a man who would become in later times the biggest nemesis to Marius. Marius in 105 is the people's military hero. He had promised to bring the Jurithine War to a swift end, and he had fallen through on his promise. Fortunately for Marius, a new military threat was moving in the north, uh, and he ex fully exploited this. For the first time, the Romans had encountered the Germans. The Romans, uh, Romans dealing with the Germans and basically the people of Northern Europe had been really limited up until this point. They had dealt with, as we've seen, the Gauls of the Po Valley. They had conquered the Gauls and annexed the Po Valley as Gallia Cisalpina in the 220s BC. And they had also had dealings with the Gauls of Southern France for some years since their acquisitions of territories in Spain uh, took them th that way. Uh, since the land route of their territories in Spain needed to be secured, they had had dealings in the south of France, uh, that area known as Provence, uh, and in 121 BC they had formed this new province, uh, which they called, rather unimaginatively, Gallia Transalpina, Gaul across the Alps. This basically is the area of southern France that is still called Provence. Their, their dealings with the tribal peoples, though, the north had been restricted primarily to the Celts. Okay, so the, Ger the Germans are a totally different language, ethnic family uh, than the Celts. And in the course of the late second century BC, German tribes, apparently from the region of modern day Denmark, that's what this map is, who had been driven out of their homes uh, in two massive migrations of people. Uh, came down south, and these are called the the Kimbri and the Teutones. Okay, and they had wended their way through Gaul and were now flanking and bordering, moving around on the edge of Roman territory in southern France. Armies sent out against them had met with ignominious defeat, and most alarmingly, a large force under the command of a proconsul. Um, uh, and a proconsular army, therefore, had been crushed and nearly everyone in the army had been slaughtered at the Battle of Arausio in 105. Uh, I know this map here says Arausio was a victory, but that was the later vi victory uh, under Marius. We'll get to that in a moment. This battle, uh, the first battle of Arausio, the defeat, is a good example of why the Romans have the dictatorship. The two commanders, the proconsul and the consul uh, himself, hated one another and refused to cooperate. They split their forces, therefore, and as a result, when the Romans, I'm sorry, when the Germans came along, they were annihilated in detail. And in any case, this caused widespread panic in Rome. Memories of the Gallic incursion of 390 came surging back. Rome was open now to the smelly hordes of Northern Europe. What to do? Well, on hand is Gaius Marius, the military hero of the people. And in an unprecedented move, he found himself elected to three more consulships in 104, 103, and 102 BC. This means in the six years between 107 BC and 102 BC, Gaius Marius had been consul for five of them. That is totally unprecedented in the whole Republican history before this. Okay, The whole idea was before you get one year as a consul, and then maybe 10, 15, 20 years later, you can try again, if you're lucky. Okay, but now he raises a new army, trains it, and goes up into southern France to take on the German threat. And what does he do? He crushes the Teutons in a huge battle in 102 BC at a place called Aquae Sextiae. This is Aix-en-Provence in France. Uh, and the Kimberley were defeated uh, by the Council of 101 with the assistance of Marius at the Battle, battle of Vercelli, which you see here. Um, 
Marius was not the, uh, I'm sorry, Marius was now very much the chief man of Rome. He was a military popular hero catapulted to prominence by virtue of his military successes. Uh, I want to um, just focus on one aspect of, uh, of one of the things that he did during this time, and then we're going to watch a short film about his victories over the Germans uh, uh, during you know, everything I just explained. But the one aspect I want to draw, on, uh, draw your attention to right now, that the thing that really was quite revolutionary about Marius's time in office was the fact that in 100 BC, as he was elected once more to the consulship, his sixth since 107, um, Marius, to effect these victories, changed a number of, or brought about a number of military reforms within the nature of the Roman army itself. In particular, well, okay, small things he did, he did away with maniples and created instead larger units called cohorts. He also moved the army toward a greater degree of professionalism. He created standing legions. So um, although the army would be raised as needed, the number of legions was always kept the same. Uh, that is the, to say they would always would, be, would have a fifth, sixth, and a seventh legion and so forth, um, which allowed a sense of unit identity to evolve, unit history to evolve, which uh, was very powerful psychological motivating force. He also brought in standards, golden eagles, as symbols of the legion's identity to the Roman army. And this gave the army, even though it was raised as ho ad hoc, a broader sense of identity and continuity in history that would lead to units competing with one another for bravery on the field. It all made for a greater effective fighting force and an esprit de corps. But the big thing, though, that he did that really changed so much was that Marius, to fight his war against Jugurtha, had felt it necessary to enlist soldiers from the Roman mob, the landless headcount, the Capite Kensi. He figured, rightfully, that this was a large, untapped pool of manpower that could be used. These men, after all, were just, you know, sitting around doing nothing. Um, but remember, there had been this rule beforehand that you only could join the army if you had enough money to pay for your own equipment, your own arms. Well, these men were going to be equipped at the state expense and their inducement for fighting was now going to be a promise of land, a land grant upon dismissal. That is upon demobilization at the end of the campaign, um, uh, Marius would see to it that you got a parcel of land that you could then raise a family on and farm and be a you know, productive member of society. He did this uh, for the, his Jugurthine veterans, and also he did this for the campaigns against the Germans. The Romans had enlisted slaves and people who fell below the property qualifications for military service in times of great crisis, but that, those were very much the exceptions. What is different with Marius here is that he makes it a standard practice. His armies that fought against Jugurtha and against the Germans were armies of landless Romans fighting as much for their own benefit as for anything else. And if we think about it, the effect of this change was remarkable because what it did was it essentially politicized the Roman military. Since the rank and file soldiers looked to their general now as their patron, he was the one who with the political connections when the war was over could secure them their land and their reward for service. What was the Roman state to a landless member of the head count? What is the res republica romana? It's a nothing. It's a, a name, a concept. But Gaius Marius, there's a man who can help me. Marius unwittingly, therefore, created a politicized Roman military, a military made up of landless soldiers who directed their loyalties toward their generals rather than any abstract notion of Rome. Now, with that uh, concept in mind, I want to... Um, uh, turn our attention to a movie that we're just going to watch, a short movie, uh, that will, I think, uh, elucidate a, a lot of these issues about the, um, the issue of, uh, of the fighting of the Germans with Marius. It is late in the second century BC, a hundred years before the crucifixion of Christ, a decade before the birth of Julius Caesar. 
Rome is facing a transition, one that will change its fundamental character forever. It comes at a time of conquest. Rome has come off 150 years of really successful foreign expansion. They've defeated Carthage, their great enemy across the Mediterranean Sea in Africa, and they've begun to expand to the north, and they've made big conquests that are hard to keep in Spain. But even as the Romans are carving out their place in the world through brutal conquest, the Republic faces a cataclysmic event that will eventually force the Romans to abandon the rule of the Senate for the absolute dictatorship of an emperor. It begins with the first barbarian war. By 113 BC, Rome has become master of the entire Mediterranean basin, but with new lands come new enemies. The Romans know that there are more people farther away, especially to the north, and that these people are, if anything, even more formidable than the armies they've defeated before, and they're worried about those people coming into Italy. Beyond the borders of Roman civilization, the soldiers face an unfamiliar breed of warrior. They call them barbarians, a word meaning foreign and crude. Anybody that didn't follow classical customs, speak classical languages, Latin or Greek, was considered to be very different, other, barbarian. And Rome simply regarded them as much less capable, much less civilized than themselves. Only the rugged Alpine mountain range keeps the northern barbarians at bay. The Alps mountain chain at the top of Italy is like the cork in the bottle that keeps the bad guys away from the Roman point of view, and the Romans don't control that cork. And so they know that it could pop out at any time and the enemy could come pouring into Italy, or at least that's their fear. Against this growing barbarian menace stands the Roman army, a volunteer militia which prides itself on being well-ordered, well-trained, and well-armed. An individual Roman soldier would be wearing metal and leather armor, a helmet, something to protect his chest. All of this armor together could weigh as much as 60 or 70 pounds, half his body weight. The burden of Rome's expansion falls squarely on the shoulders of these battle-hardened men. But back in the capital, it's the wealthy government officials who reap the benefits. Rome is not an empire yet, but a republic ruled by the Senate. At the top of the political ladder are two elected officers known as consuls. They were the highest civilian and military officials in Rome Above all, their responsibility was to lead the army because national security came first. But they were also, because of their tremendous prominence, very important in setting the agenda for politics, for legislation, for reform. Though the Roman Republic embraces democratic ideals, all men are not created equal. Soldiers may win the battles for Rome, but they dare not hope to achieve the position of consul. The highest office is reserved for members of Rome's most important families, like Gnaeus Papirius Carbo. A very small number of families dominated the elections to become consul. This is part of the belief that Rome really needed the kind of honor that came from a long, distinguished family history. Now, as Rome expands, this honor is no longer based on merit, but on money. 
what's happening in Rome is as Rome conquers more territory, more wealth is going to flow into the city. And there's a sense that wealth is going to demoralize the citizen body and the aristocracy both. That as wealth becomes more and more uh, uh, powerful in Roman society, more and more enticing, that this is going to infiltrate its way into the political process. By spreading around his wealth, Carbo can buy his place as consul. In terms of campaigning, uh, one of the things that you'll find as you go on later in the Republic is the system becomes extremely corrupt. You have people bestowing all sorts of largesse, any sort of little kind of gifts or remuneration uh, in order to get your, your vote. But in the North, a dangerous new tribe, the Kimbri, is on the move. From their home in Northern Europe, they journey south toward Roman territory. Completely uncivilized, the Kimbri radiate terror, according to the famous ancient biographer, Plutarch. They were believed to be German tribes based on their great size, the light blue color of their eyes, and the fact that their name, Kimbri, is the German nickname for plunderers. Led by the great warlord, Boyrix, the horde leaves a smoking trail of destruction in its wake. They were characteristic Iron Age peoples. We don't really know exactly what it is they were after. They may have been moving in order to attack and invade uh, provinces that were becoming wealthy through trade with Rome. They may have simply been coming to seek their fortunes in what they perceived as a richer land near the Mediterranean. The Kimbri aren't the only ones lured by Rome's growing wealth. On the way south, Two more barbarian tribes join them, the Tetones and Ambrones. The combined barbarian armies are heading straight for an alpine pass into Roman territory, guarded by the simple villagers of Noricum. Though Noricum is not a Roman territory, its proximity to the Roman border ties its people closely to the Republic. Noricum is the area that we would say today is essentially Austria. The people who live there are the Noriki, uh, and th therefore they, the territory is named after them. The people there, the Noriki, controlled the Alpine passes. Romans also rely on the Norikans for trade, as their skills working in precious metals and iron are well known. What the Noricans actually have available in the way of raw materials is gold, silver, and salt. Mineable salt in the Alps is, is a major industry. So the Romans truly needed large quantities of salt for preservative, and they had to have that, and they had to have it all the time. The Norican villages provide an irresistible target to the merciless Kimbri warriors. <laughs> Hungry for loot, they are rapacious and heavily armed for the raid. By the period we're talking about, the second and first centuries BC, the Kimbri had very effective swords, spears, um, shields, helmets are rarer, but they were fully equipped with very able kinds of weapons. But the barbarians are after more than the Norican's wealth. The northern barbarians who were migrating, what they wanted above all was land. They weren't there to raid and leave, they wanted to live uh, next to the Romans. The craftsmen of Noricum stand no chance against the warriors of the north. The Noricans send an emissary to their allies in the Roman Senate begging for help against the vicious Kimbri invaders. They seek out the aristocrat Carbo, whose politicking has finally paid off. He now holds the post of consul, the most prestigious office in Rome. Carbo orders his aide to begin preparations for war. He has just one year to win the glory and riches that come from battle. We're talking about needing to show the qualities of leadership through a display of manliness. 
And a display of manualness meant success on the battlefield. Generals not only feathered the nest of themselves and their families, but of all their supporters. Carbo takes the challenge, leading his troops to Noricum. Despite an utter lack of experience in the ways of war, he is eager to prove that he is more than just a wealthy senator. He arrives in Noricum, backed by the men of the Roman army. After a century of victories, they exude confidence. The Cimbri claimed they didn't know that they were in territory that they shouldn't have been in. They sent ambassadors. The barbarians have never seen such a well-equipped and disciplined force. The warlord Boyrix tells Carbo his people only wish to return home peacefully. Carbo agrees to let them go. But there is little glory in a truce. The Roman general devises a plan to force the victory he so badly needs. Carbo pretended that he was going to negotiate and then he sent his troops on a shortcut to attack the Cimbri before the ambassadors could get back, thinking that his sneak attack would work. Carbo's plan backfires. The Roman commander Carbo outfoxed this group called the Cimbri, but he did it in a way that smelled of disgrace. A few of the Cimbrian ambassadors survived to carry a tale of treachery back to the barbarian camp. Furious, the barbarians swear they will never leave until they exact bloody revenge. In 113 BC, the Roman general Carbo parlays for peace with violent barbarians, the Cimbri. Then he turns around and murders their ambassadors. His treachery enrages the barbarians, who value honor above all else. Vowing to avenge their fallen comrades, the Cimbri strike back with swift and sudden fury. Classical biographer Plutarch. Their courage and daring were irresistible. They rushed into battle with the speed of a raging fire. Nothing could stand up to them. Led by two warlords, Boyrix of the Cimbri and Tutabad of the Teutones, the barbarians advance in inexhaustible waves. The archaeology tells us that they had very good weapons, not inferior to Romans. It tells us that they had really real military organization with infantry troops, with officer corps. So we can, we can tell quite a bit. Certainly we can tell much more than the Romans seemed to understand until it was too late. Consul Carbo suddenly finds himself far from the comfort and privilege of Roman politics. Here, the language of power is spoken in steel and blood. As consul, chief war magistrate, he fails miserably. Because the chief war magistrate is only out there for a year, it's very frequently amateur hour out there on the field of battle. Uh, so you end up with uh, very frequently inept leadership uh, in a very important position, and it, on occasion results in disaster for the Romans. The battle for Noricum is such a disaster. The Romans were in the end saved from being pushed over the cliff into the hell of utter destruction only by a giant storm, lightning, thunder, and rain. Knocked from his horse, Carbo struggles to flee from the deadly chaos. He escapes the battle only to commit suicide, for he has disgraced himself and Rome in the eyes of the gods. The gods saved the Romans, but only just and only after many, many had been killed. What did that mean? It meant the gods were unhappy at the way the Romans behaved. And yet the Romans cling to the notion that only the aristocrats can lead them to victory. The Romans believed that old meant good, new meant dangerous. So they 
for their politicians and their leaders, they preferred people with a long, distinguished family history. Over the next decade, a string of nobles, all armed with more arrogance than skill, lead armies north to protect Rome's province in Gaul. They meet the barbarians at Tulosa, Bertagala, and finally Arasio, present-day Toulouse, Bordeaux, and Orange, France. In each instance, the barbarians completely rout Rome's heralded legions. The Romans had their particular formal ways of fighting. If we think of the beginning of the film Gladiator, that's a perfect representation of how Rome liked to fight. Take hours to set up everything in the battle order and then launch the attack. In contrast, the barbarians' counterattack is unpredictable and devastating to the Roman lines. You have these lines of men, and if the person next to you goes down, the person behind will step into that gap. Uh, and, and death would be much, much more intimate. The death toll is staggering. At Orasio alone, 80,000 Romans are massacred in a single afternoon. When an army lost its cohesiveness, then the men were literally like fish in a barrel to be picked off at leisure by the other side. So when a side has been defeated, then the victors, they just slaughter them one by one with no danger to the people doing the slaughtering. It's not a battle anymore, it's a mass execution. By 105 BC, the Cimbri and their allies desire much more than Roman blood and booty. Some members of the clan want to set down roots. They were farming peoples, they uh, engaged in trade, um, they lived in small villages, people were growing wheat and barley, rye, oats, millet, a whole variety of different kinds of cereals. They were raising lentils and peas and beans and other kinds of garden crops. Cattle were extremely important. Pigs, sheep and goat were all being raised. This new domesticity alarms the Romans. To their minds, the only thing more threatening than a barbarian warrior is a barbarian woman. The presence of women is a standard Roman way of communicating that this is an invasion for settlement. In other words, this is a group that's coming in to significantly alter the way we live, to threaten our basic values. If it's just a raid, it's just a bunch of teenage guys, we can deal with that. But see, when we throw women into the description, we have the migratory feature, and there it's a permanency. It requires a sterner and long-term solution. It requires a general who can beat the barbarians back once and for all. The hero Rome so desperately needs emerges on another hotly contested borderland, nearly a thousand miles away, in Numidia, part of present-day Algeria. For eight long years, the Romans have tasted only defeat here, until now. The name of their savior is Marius. With guts and cunning, he crushes the Numidian armies of the rogue king Jugurtha. great soldiers, and Marius was the greatest Rome had yet seen. Both because he was a great commander, Marius could pick the right time and the right place for a battle, but also because he won his soldiers' loyalty and affection by getting down and digging ditches with them, by eating the same rough food, by being in better shape than even they were, and they were the best conditioned soldiers in the world. 
he comes by his common touch naturally, for Marius is no aristocrat. Still, he speaks of his humble background with pride. I cannot point to my ancestors, but I can show medals and other military honors to say nothing of the scars on my body, all of them in front. These are my title of nobility. Now, as the northern barbarians close in, the Romans turn to Marius, their last and best hope. At the end of the second century BC, a violent barbarian tribe, the Cimbri, along with their allies, the Teutones and Ambrones, lay waste to the northern frontier. A horrified Rome turns to its greatest general and new consul, Marius. He's a proven military commander, and you don't want to fool around when you have uh, Teutones and Cimbri who have defeated army after army. You really want to take care of the problem urgently, and so you want to send a capable leader out on the field. But even the great Marius cannot lead without men to follow him. Devastated by a decade of war, Rome faces critical troop shortages. If you have uh, as many men lost, the German tribes in uh, 113 and 109 and 107 uh, and 106 and 105, as the Romans did, that's going to traumatize Roman society pretty severely. Despite a vigorous recruitment campaign, Marius cannot find enough qualified men, landholders, who are willing to serve. To be in the Roman army in the High Republic, you had to have a property qualification. You had to be a person of means, uh, and, uh, and this causes some problems for the Roman army because there's a problem with manpower. Marius' solution is as simple as it is radical. He sends his recruiters out to seek soldiers among the landless poor. You don't have to be a property holder to be a Roman citizen, so why should you have to be a property owner to be a legionnaire? Many people wish to be soldiers. It's a good job, uh, and it's probably an exciting job. O opportunities for booty, wine, women, and song, chance to see the world at government expense, etc. Uh, the same things that we see on our recruitment posters. Marius said anybody can be in the army. This then gave the Romans a much greater pool of men on which to draw to strengthen their legions because in Roman society there were many, many, many more poor than there were middle class. The old guard judges recruits by their income. Marius judges his by their fighting potential. Stand up against a legionary and you can stand up to the barbarians. By extending the search for legionnaires down into the proletariat, what that rather quickly does is it makes the ordinary soldier even more dependent upon the success of the commander. The general is expected to provide for his men and to provide for them as soon as he can and to be generous. Lured by the promise of wealth, a new breed of Roman soldier marches to war. Marius pledges to give them all the tools and skills they need. I will teach you to strike down an enemy, fear nothing but disgrace, to sleep on bare ground and work hard on an empty stomach. In 104 BC, Marius and his army set off for Gaul to meet the Cimbri. In a stroke of good fortune for the Romans, the barbarians choose that very moment to leave Gaul and raid Hispania instead. It is a tactical mistake that buys Marius valuable time. Marius molds his new army from the ground up. He not only hardens them to the rigors of a soldier's life, he makes them love it. Marius made lots of innovations in the army. For example, he gave each uh, legion an eagle, a silver eagle as its standard. He trained his men to carry uh, what they needed on campaign so they could move faster. Um, but he weighed them down so much that they called themselves Marius's mules. Uh, Marius didn't need pack animals for his army to go on campaign. He already had his mules and they only had two legs. But they were more effective. They were more flexible. 
and it's the flexibility of the legions that is enhanced by Marius's military reforms, including the standardization of equipment. Well equipped and unified in spirit, Marius's mules are transformed but untested. Two years pass with no sign of the barbarians. Still, the fear they inspire remains. Panicked, the Romans ignore their own ancient traditions about term limits and re-elect Marius Consul, the chief magistrate of war. I think part of the problem is to deal with the threat from the north, you have to give Marius this extraordinary command where in 104, 103, 102, 101, 100, he's consul, boom, 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 boom. At last in 102 BC, the Phantom Menace becomes real. The Cimbri, Teutones, and Ambrones sweep out of the north and west on a collision course with Rome. Marius builds a fortress near Arasio. He sends another army to guard Noricum. For above all else, the Alpine passes into Italy must be protected. Within weeks, half of the horde, the Teutones and Ambrones, swarm around Marius's fort, a terrifying sight according to Plutarch. Their numbers appeared to be infinite. They were hideous to look at. Their speech and their shouting were unlike anything that anyone had ever heard before. And yet Marius forces his men to look and learn. Marius was a brilliant military man. He understood the life and the thoughts and the psychology of a soldier. What Marius gave to the Roman Republic was confidence that Romans could defeat the fiercest barbarians in the world. The fortress holds. The Teutones and Ambrones cannot pass. 150,000 strong, they head south, seeking another Alpine pass. The Romans pursue them at a distance, in no hurry to engage till the right time and place. For Marius has already picked out the perfect battlefield, where he will at last unleash the power of his unconventional army. In 102 BC, hundreds of thousands of barbarians swarm towards Italy. The great Roman general Marius pursues the Teutones and the Ambrones, as they seek a pass over the Alps. He moves his troops from his fortress at Arasio to Aquae Sextiae, modern-day Aix-en-Provence, France. There, Marius orders his men to set up camp. He chooses his position carefully. The Roman camp is a, uh, is a singular military uh, piece of machinery. It would preferably be on high ground in order to see any kind of enemy maneuvers. It's going to be laid out on a grid pattern. Uh, you're going to surround it with a deep ditch, and you're going to have a rampart dug ab or, uh, uh, heaped up above that ditch, what's known as an agar, uh, and everyone would have their place. There is one more feature that most camps have, but this particular camp is lacking. Classical biographer Plutarch. Marius chose a place that was not very well supplied with water. They said he did this deliberately so as to encourage his soldiers to fight. When people complained they were thirsty, Marius pointed to a river running close by the barbarian camp. There is some drinking water for you, he said, but you have to pay for it with blood. On the banks of the Rhone River, settled side by side in two great camps, the Ambrones and Teutones have plenty of fresh drinking water. Confident that the Romans are no match for them, the Ambrones lose themselves in feasting and making merry. The Romans, especially the ordinary soldiers, were afraid of the northern barbarians, the ones from the farthest north, from the coldest climates. Tough climates made for tough men. They were much bigger than the Romans, they were much louder than the Romans, and from the Roman point of view, they were smelly. Not because they didn't bathe, they probably bathed more than the Roman soldiers, but they used, shall we say, a different cologne, bear fat. The Romans were used to the scent of olive oil. They never suspect the danger lurking in the forest as a small but desperate contingent of Marius's troops 
creep up on the barbarian camp. Roman soldiers were always afraid because they weren't fools. They knew that they were going to be in danger of being killed just as easily as the enemy because Roman soldiers didn't do their real killing from a distance. Marius's mules throw themselves into the skirmish, but the barbarians swiftly rally in overwhelming numbers. Just as defeat closes in on the Romans, Marius orders reinforcements into the fray. Re-energized, the Romans push the Ambrones back to their camp. There, the battle takes a strange turn, as Plutarch reports. The women came out armed with swords and axes and making the most horrible shrieking. They threw themselves into the thick of the fighting, and though their bodies were gashed and wounded, they endured it to the end with unbroken spirits. The barbarian women always came to the battlefield. Sometimes the women would pull the wagons up right behind the men so that they couldn't retreat from battle. They'd block them in. The women were so uh, aware of their sense of honor and liberty that they thought death was better than retreat. The Romans thought that uh, these women were unbelievably brave, unbelievably courageous. They thought that these barbarians were the ultimate risk takers. By bringing their family to the battlefield, they're putting everything on that one roll of the dice. We win or we die, and that means all of us, men, women, children, babies. But the Romans also have something to protect their honor and homeland. With the skills that Marius has taught them, they earned their first victory over the German invaders in more than a decade. Back at camp, Marius prepares for the revenge attack that will certainly be launched by Tutabad, king of the Teutones. In Aquisextii, he faced a really difficult tactical situation. As usual, the enemy far outnumbered the Romans. But Marius, always able to choose the right time and the right place, carefully selected the terrain. He lays a trap with his trusted captain, Claudius Marcellus. Marius sends Marcellus with 3,000 men into the woods behind the Teutonis camp. He instructs them to lay low until the fighting begins. The barbarians, spoiling for vengeance, charge up the hill to the Roman camp, just as Marius has planned. They meet a wall of swords, according to Plutarch. Marius himself fought in the front rank, putting into practice the orders he'd given his soldiers. For he was in as good training as anyone, and in daring, he far surpassed them all. This battle was a real test of Marius's philosophy in creating his mules that were strong enough to stand up uh, with all of their armor and to stay in position and to hold their discipline even when the enemy was yelling and charging with a fantastic fierceness. In full armor, rushed them with their swords so that they could be like a flying wedge coming downhill and smashing the enemy. As Marius and his men forced the barbarians back, Marcellus and his cohorts burst from the woods. Together they snuff out any hope of retreat for King Tutabad and his warriors. The body count defies imagination. The Romans slaughter more than 100,000 Teutones. The rest they take as slaves, spoils of war that will make Marius's mules and all of his supporters rich. His patronage is not just to the soldiers. He is very generous to all Romans of all ranks. Marius, by monopolizing power at the very top, in, in, in reality becomes the patron of even members of the senatorial class. Swept up by the barbarian fever, 
the Romans once again elect Marius to Rome's most important office. He will serve as consul for an unprecedented fifth term. There was such an immense fear that the barbarians would come pouring in through the gateway of the Alps, which the Romans didn't control, and lay waste to Italy and sack Rome. Politics has to take the hindmost. For Rome is not out of danger. Marius has only crushed half of the barbarian horde. The Cimbri, the most fearsome barbarians of all, are still on the loose. While Marius is in Rome, the Cimbri break through the Roman fortifications at Noricum. The enemy has at last breached Italy's borders and is ravaging the Po Plain. Clearly, only one man has the courage and cunning to meet this new crisis, Consul Marius. In 102 BC, Marius's mules massacre the violent barbarian tribe, the Tetones, in southern Gaul, destroying half of the barbarian force. But the terrifying Cimbri tribe slips through the Austrian Alps. From Rome, Marius rushes north to the Po Plain, vowing to eliminate the barbarians once and for all. When Marius arrives in the Roman camp, the Cimbri send him an envoy. They come not to attack, but to make demands. The Cimbri come to him and say, we want land. That's what we want. We don't want to fight. We want land just like the land you gave our neighboring tribe there across the mountains in France. The Cimbri apparently haven't heard about the disaster that has befallen their Tetone comrades. So Marius, with a crooked smile on his face, a smirk maybe, says to them, oh, you don't have to worry. Your brothers, they already have their land. We'd be happy to give the same land to you, meaning your graves in the earth. In disbelief, the Cimbri demand proof, according to Plutarch. Marius mocked, but your friend is right here. Please don't go without saying hello to him. And he ordered Tutabad, king of the Teutones, to be brought forward in chains. Marius will cut no deal with the Cimbri. Their envoy leaves, swearing to take revenge for their fallen allies. Despite Marius's recent victory over the barbarians, the Romans are still vastly outnumbered by the fierce northern warriors. With battle looming, the great general calls for an animal sacrifice. The Romans would always have a sacrifice before going into battle to see if the gods would send them the message, there's nothing wrong with your plan. It didn't guarantee victory, but it meant you had a chance. And the Romans took that very seriously. The Romans' faith is their only shield in the face of overwhelming odds. By the end of tomorrow, a tidal wave of blood will flow, whose blood remains in the hands of the gods. Marius searches the goat entrails for a sign and finds that the heavens are with him. In 101 BC, all Rome holds its breath as two mortal enemies meet outside the hamlet of Vercelli, Italy. 15,000 strong, the Cimbri cavalry rides onto the field of battle. Right behind them come the fearsome infantry, like a cloud of locusts on the move. As the Roman line is set, Marius makes a final appeal to the gods classical biographer Plutarch. Marius washed his hands and lifting them up to heaven vowed to make a sacrifice of a hundred beasts should victory be his. Altogether the Romans number a little more than 50,000 men. They face at least twice as many Cimbri. It's the Romans worst nightmare but Marius outsmarts the enemy. He gets his troops in position first so that the sun will rise behind the Roman soldiers. When the sun gets to its full power, it reflects off the Romans' shiny armor, and the barbarians think that the sky is on fire. 
like the gods have sent lightning bolts to help their enemies. Sensing the Kimbri's sudden anxiety, the Romans attack. <laughs> Uh, do have slingers, they do have archers, but the foot infantry is the mainstay of the battle. You're going to get blood on you, you're going to get the groans of the person you're killing, the person who's getting killed next to you. You can't tell what's going on behind you or to the side of you because you're wearing a helmet. You can hardly hear and you can only see straight ahead. It required courage and dedication in overcoming your fear uh, to an overwhelmingly amazing degree. At Vercelli, the Romans wipe out 120,000 Cimbri. More importantly, they cast out the shadow of fear that has terrorized Rome for 13 years. Marius returns home from the Cimbrian War a hero. Adoring crowds hail him as the savior of Rome despite their own long-standing rule that no one should serve consecutive consulships, they clamor for him to once again run for consul. As Marius is doing this, he's moving little by little toward becoming, in the eyes of the people, a permanent head of this enterprise, so that we're approaching having an emperor. It is exactly what the aristocracy has worried about all along. Now that the barbarian danger has passed, many nobles are openly hostile to Marius. To stay in power, Marius must find support elsewhere. He seeks out corrupt politicians whose tools include bribery and murder. As a politician, Marius was not good at choosing who should be his allies. The battlefield of politics was one in which Marius was not decisive and wasn't insightful the way he was on the battlefield of javelins and swords. Jealous of other rising military stars, Marius orders the assassination of many of his rivals. Under Marius's leadership, violence, not debate becomes the currency used to settle political differences. He has saved Rome only to cut out the heart of the Republic. <laughs> Yet Marius never loses the love of the people. In 86 BC, shortly before his death, they elect him to an extraordinary seventh consulship. He left a legacy of power in the hands of the military. He left a legacy of popular support for one man in power. It's a hinge event because the balance of power will shift. Uh, instead of 10 or 20 ruling families controlling the consulship, you'll start to have just these grand warlords. The power of money, the power of having all of those men behind their back, uh, whether through actually uh, uh, in the form of giving them political support or actually using it as a potential threat to go against their political enemies, uh, it's going to really be a problem for the Roman government down the road. As the empire starts a long, slow slide into dictatorship, Rome is launched into an apocalypse of political injustice and endless war from which there is no return. All right, my friends. Uh, so that the movie ended with a little kind of like a flash forward uh to uh, to his death in 86 but there's we need to we need to back up from that so i want to take it right now our narrative from the moment when the wars with the german germans end and uh marius is in his sixth consulship in the year 100. the events of marius's sixth consulship uh, in 100, illustrate both his incompetence as a politician, as we're going to see, he wasn't nearly so much a shrewd politician as he was a military man, and also something of the ramifications, which he did, does not seem to have appreciated, 
uh, of uh, regarding his change in the enlistment procedures for the Roman army. In this year 100, Marius used a tribune, a man named Lucius Apuleius Saturninus, to pass land bills in 103 BC. Um, I'm sorry, so this is a little bit backing up a little bit now. In 103 BC, Marius had used this man, Lucius Apuleius Saturninus, to pass land bills so, that, so as to settle the veterans from his war against Jugurtha. And in 100 BC, he also used the same tribune, who was tribune again in 100, Lucius Apuleius Saturninus, to try to force through legislation now giving land for his German campaigns, uh, the veterans from those campaigns. This legislation in 100 met with some opposition because on the day of the meetings, just prior to the day of the comitia, that is the voting day, to establish and vote on these measures, Apuleius sent around heralds and urged them to come into town and vote on this day. Many of the country folk who were Marius's veterans from his previous wars heard this call and they came in to town ready for action, ready to back up their men. At the actual assembly, the city folk took exception to the attitude of the country voters. I suppose country and city rivalries have always been what they are. Uh, and these city folk hitched up their togas and broke up the benches that were around and attacked the country voters on, in a mass riot. The country folk, for their part, responded with staves and whatever they could find, and the whole committee broke out into an abject riot. The law settling the Ger German veterans was passed, and Marius's veterans got their land. Now, Marius, because of this, became associated with this rather unsavory character of Saturninus. Now, Saturninus had his own agenda, and Marius did not even realize it. Saturninus had another partner in crime, a man who was praetor in 100 BC, and whom he wanted elected as consul for the following year. So that was kind of his own agenda that he wanted to push forward. And together, Saturninus and this other partner in crime named Gaius Servilius Glaucia were going to push through other reforms that they wanted. We might even call it a revolutionary agenda. However, one of the other consul, can, consular candidates was much more popular with the mob than this man, Glaucia, was uh, Saturninus's partner. And shockingly, at the elections, when this more popular figure came forward to give his speech, agents of Saturninus assaulted him on the platform at the elections and actually stabbed him to death in front of every, the whole mob. This is the stage that we have reached in Roman politics. This is the legacy of the Gracchi manifested. The people, of course, were incensed at such behavior, and Saturninus and his colleague were assaulted and hastily took up refuge on the Capitoline Hill. And now remember, Marius is consul in this same year 100, when he had used the, the, uh, this man, Saturninus, to help push through his land uh, his land uh, bill for his veterans so now he this was his partner this was the guy that he used and, and now he kind of has been totally outmaneuvered because marius as the consul was now been would, was now going to be called upon by the senate to restore order the senate indeed passed the senatus consultum ultimum the declaration of martial law and marius was forced if he was put into a position of either having to turn on his own former political ally or basically let him get away with murder, literally. He was totally outmaneuvered, therefore, politically, and made to look like a fool. Saturninus and his colleagues were given a promise of safe passage off of the capital from the building that they were hiding out in. But as soon as they came out, they were attacked by the mob. They took refuge in the Senate House then, where they were pelted to death with tiles from the roof. Now, a Roman roofing tile is about two feet by two feet and several inches thick. They would make very formidable projectiles. And so we're talking about large pieces of jagged pottery raining down on these unfortunate men inside of the Senate House. They were effectively lynched. But more importantly, Marius was made to look like a fool and he was made to look untrustworthy. He was made to look like he had utterly failed to divine the true nature of his ally, Saturninus, which he had. 
uh, he had completely failed to appreciate the true nature of this man's designs. And as a result, after his consulship in 100, Marius retired into relative obscurity and private life, uh, apparently just spending his days glutting himself on his favorite seafood oysters. He was still a well-recognized but not prominent figure in Rome in the 90s BC, and the baton at that point passed to his one-time quaestor, Lucius Cornelius Sulla. Sulla was a patrician. Unlike Marius, he was not a new man. He was from a well-established, although impoverished, patrician family. He had a very high sense of his patrician heritage and his nobility. He had served with Marius against Jugurtha and had also served with him in the German campaigns. He was a very effective officer. Sulla and Marius in those early days appeared to have been on relatively good terms until Marius failed to give Sulla due credit for capturing Jugurtha in 105 BC. You remember, it was to Sulla and not Marius that that King Bocchus of Mauritania had, uh, had given over Jugurtha. And this is just the sort of thing that Roman politics centered on, dignitas, one's reputation, one's face in the public eye. So this was a slight, an insult to Sulla's reputation, and it seems from this point onwards in the late second century, there was no love loss between Sulla and Marius. But the political issue that was to prove the next bone of contention in the Roman Revolution was one of uh, uh, that we had already seen in the tribunician period of Gaius Gracchus, and that was the issue of the, of the status of the allies. Because since the late second century, petitioning for the full enfranchisement of the Italian allies had continued. All efforts to carry it had been blocked. The allies' patience, therefore, was wearing very thin. And in 91 BC, a tribune of the people named Marcus Livius Drusus, uh, not the same Marcus Livius Drusus that I mentioned earlier on. <laughs> Unfortunately, these people all have the same names. But he was the son of that tribune who had outbid Gaius Gracchus. This, this Drusus now prepared to pass a law to solve this issue of the enfranchisement of the Allies once and for all. Drusus recognized it was a very incendiary, potentially disastrous, disastrous issue facing the Roman Senate. I'm sorry, the state. Drusus was a rather arrogant man and not well liked by his colleagues. His stance on the issue of enfranchisement of the allies was not, therefore, a popular one among the people. And we have seen this, uh, that the Roman people had become rather zealous of their citizenship and were not entirely willing to see all of the Italians raised up to the same level as themselves. So as a result, for much of his tribunate, Drusus had to stay indoors for fear of violence. He did, however to carry out his duties, have to physically show up at any meetings for which he wanted to set a date for a future vote or put a proposal or bring a bill. One could not do that sort of thing from one's house. You couldn't work from home. So this is a key point of the structural institutional nature of the Roman state that we've talked about. Magistrates had to carry out their duties in public and in person. And on one of these meetings, Drusus came out of his house and on his way back, he was stabbed to death in the side, uh, stabbed in the side and died a few hours later. With Drusus died his proposal to enfranchise the Italians. And that was the last straw. This now, some of the allies took, especially those who were descendants of the Samnites, um, there were, were still Samnites, in fact, in the central part of Italy, south and west of Rome, this they took, um, uh, as the last straw, and so they took their demand for enfranchisement a step further and rebelled. The goals of the secessionist allies changed over this period. Uh, not only were they now fighting for enfranchisement, it seemed that they were fighting for a free Italy. They, they, formed, they wanted to form a new state, Italia, and they began to fight for the removal of Roman power in Italy. In other words, here in 91 BC, the Romans find themselves at war with their own allies, allies that they had, that, uh, that they had, had for centuries, in fact, uh, and who therefore knew how to fight just as well as they did. This war, they called, for that reason, the social war, the war of the allies, the bellum socialis, socialis, sorry, uh, 
the, the, uh, the Latin word for ally is socius, so bellum sociale is the war of the allies. Or it, sometimes it's anglicized to the social war, actually. But it was an essentially Italian civil war. Needless to say, it was pointless. Uh, the war was particularly violent and savage. The Romans basically were forced uh, into this war by so zealously guarding their own citizenship. And now they found themselves hard pressed, their own allies, men whom they had fought beside, who were fully trained and equipped in the Roman fashion and were therefore a formidable fighting force, were now at their doorsteps. It must be said that not all the allies turned on Rome. The core heartland of the Roman Confederacy around Latium still stayed loyal, but that was not enough. Too much of Italy was now in arms against them. And this, to me, was one of the great ironies of this war. In order to lure the Allies back, within one year of the war starting, the Romans granted the, the request that had started the war in the first place. They offered full citizenship to any of the now rebel Allies who returned to loyalty with Rome. And this carrot was quite effective. It seems uh, that uh, the Romans realized that the war was completely pointless, which it was, totally needless. If they had just done this before the war had broken out in 91, there would not have been a war. But as it turned out, they had to do it under the threat of destruction. Some of the allies, though, had thrown their hats in too deeply with the issue of the secession from Rome. And while many of them did turn over, come back to the fold of the Roman Confederacy, the war uh, in those other corners lasted until 88 BC. It was a brutal conflict. And it saw, interesting enough, Marius, of all people, emerge out of retirement once more to take control of Roman forces in the north of Italy. Sulla, for his part, and who had been a praetor some years previously, was given the role of a pro-praetor, he was given pro praetorium imperium over the southern part of Italy. So the two men did not actually do a lot of meeting of, with one another, but they did cooperate overall in taking care of the social war in their respective halves of the peninsula, their respective theaters of operation. Marius and Sulla then had come together in a sense to fight this war, and it proved to be a very effective combination. You're talking about two men who are very effective military leaders, and the war was over by 88 BC. However, we will see that events in the Eastern Mediterranean were to rise up to bring these two men now into conflict immediately after the end of the social war. We'll talk about that though in a moment. It is worth pausing at this point to just see the stage we have reached in the development of the Roman Revolution. It's worth doing this on a frequent basis because we can analyze the state of affairs um, as we proceed through the facts. Right? History is never just about what happened, but it's also about an analysis of those events. So what had started out as a proposal for land reform uh, had reached the stage now within a generation of the tribunate of Tiberius Gracchus of spiraling disorder. The committee meetings and assemblies that took place in 100 BC are perfectly exemplar of this. It was not uncommon to find popular assemblies, whether constituted for the purpose of voting or discussing a proposal, breaking up into an abject riot. It was not uncommon for tribunes of the people to have hired gangs of hooligans, street gangsters in their employ, to help force through legislation, to intimidate opponents. For instance, Livius Drusus felt he had to stay at home for as long as he could for fear of going outside, and his fears were proven absolutely right. When he did venture outside, he found himself stabbed to death. It was not uncommon as well, and this is a very important point, for ambitious generals, men well-connected higher up in the Roman nobility, to use these tribunes and their hired gangs of hooligans and ruffians for their own purposes. And this is a pattern we will now see increasingly more common in the Roman Revolution as we foresee it. The use of tribunes by men in a greater position of influence for their own particular agenda, usually forcing through land bills for their armies, for their now landless armies are forcing through other legislation that benefited themselves. This is a pattern that we will see again and again. The use of the popularis approach by men of higher rank. What we have not seen yet, and what we are going to now see as we fin round out this lecture for today, is the direct infusion of the Roman military into this whole scenario. 
what we have right now at this point is really a situation of domestic civil uh you know uh, unrest rioting beatings occasional political assassinations what we have not reached yet but we're about to is the stage where roman troops under arms would be directly used in the conflicts between the leaders of the roman state and that was the stage really the next logical development of the roman revolution that was to be initiated by the man you see in front of you Sulla. that was to take place uh, in the year 88 bc the very same year that the social war was brought to an end uh, because and the thing that would bring it about is that in Turkey, in modern-day Turkey, in the eastern half of the Roman Empire, a foreign king was carrying out actions that were to bring Sulla and Marius into direct conflict and into the first civil war. That man is the person you see in front of you now, Mithridates VI of Pontus, the poison king, subject indeed of Mozart's first opera, which he wrote, I think, at the age of 12 or something like that. Um, Mithridates VI was a native uh, of this area in Asia Minor. He was, uh, he, uh, he was a half Greek, half Persian um, uh, individual. His name, Mithridates, is kind of a Hellenized version of the Persian god Mithras. And uh, he called himself Eupator, which means basically the good father, kind of like a benevolent ruler type of person. Um, and he was very, uh, from a very young age, he was very ambitious. And, um, he, and at a certain point, he was the king of this small little kingdom of Pontus in Asia Minor. But at a certain point, he understood because of the Romans dealing with their problems with their allies, he saw a chance for, to kind of uh, give full reign to his ambitions. Because the Romans who were living in that part of the world, the merchants and some citizens who had settled down and other people who maybe just were, you know, over there expats for whatever reason, the Romans were not very well liked in the Eastern Mediterranean. Here, of course, was the richest part of the Mediterranean world, uh, affluent cities with long histories of culture behind them. Certainly the depredations of Roman tax farmers, the publicani, and other extortionate members of the Roman ruling class who showed up there in the wake of Roman power, uh, uh, being Roman power being established in the Eastern Mediterranean, had not made the Romans especially popular with the people of the Eastern Mediterranean. And so, in the year 89 BC, Mithridates VI of Pontus took the opportunity of Rome's focus on, on matters Italian, that is, dealing with their own allies. He took this opportunity to seize control of many of Rome's holdings in the eastern part of the empire. He overran the province of Asia, and he positioned himself as a champion of the Greeks against Roman oppression. And the ploy worked. And many of the Greek islands also defected to this new banner of rebellion against Rome. In a desperate measure in 89 BC, after he had gained control over large sectors of Rome's eastern holdings, Mithridates issued a directive to those now in his control. The directive and the event that followed are oftentimes termed the Asiatic Vespers. Because in this directive, all Romans and Italians, be they soldiers or civilians, governors or businessmen, living in the islands now controlled by Mithridates, were to be killed on a single day. According to our sources, some 80,000 people, men, women, and children, perished on this occasion. Whatever it was about Mithridates' behavior in taking over and overrunning Roman interests in Asia, this act ensured that the wrath of Rome would be severe and that Mithridates would not be allowed to rest until the Romans had dealt with him. News of the Mithridatic War reached Rome in 88 BC, just after the social war had been concluded, at a time when Sulla was consul for the first time. He had been praetor already, so now, after excellent military service in the social war, he had been elected to the consulship for that year. It was the traditional practice of the Senate to assign provinces to consuls sitting in office, so the Senate assigned Sulla the war against Mithridates. Now, the, uh, that would have been fine, but then all of a sudden something odd happened. Marius, for whatever reason, 
came out of the shadows, lusting after the same command. He perhaps did have a taste of, you know, after years in the wings, glutting himself on oysters, <laughs> following his disastrous consulship of 100 BC. He had a taste of the old glory days in the military life again in the social war. He may have felt himself, even though an old man now, back in the public light once more, reliving his days as the military hero of the Roman people. And although Scylla had, through the proper procedure, been appointed to the command against Mithridates, Marius took the other route. He suborned a tribune of the people, Publius Sulpicius Rufus, to uh, bring a a uh, bill in front of the tribal assembly of the plebs assigning the same command to Marius amidst uh, scenes uh, of tremendous disorder and violence the bill was passed so you have Sulla being given the proper command uh, through the proper uh, senatorial procedure given the command against Mithridates but now Marius by his own kind of you know extortion bribery whatever you want to call it he's able to get this guy Sulpicius Rufus to give him the command through passing a, a law through the um, through the tribunate office. And the bill was passed. Sulpicius's supporters showed up with daggers concealed in their garments, and when a tribune was speaking against the bill, he was cut down where he stood on the platform. The situation illustrates perfectly the conflict between the two methods of using the Roman constitution that was now becoming so increasingly common in the courts of the revolution. The root of the optimates using the Senate, having assigned Sulla in the traditional way to command against Mithridates, and now the root of the populares using a tribune of the people and the tribal assembly of the plebs, having assigned the same command to Marius. The situation was intolerable, but Sulla's reaction to it was far worse, and it set the worst precedent yet in the Roman Revolution. Sulla when he heard the news about Marius's appointment to what he considered to be his command, um, he heard it when he was already in southern Italy in the area of Campania, gathering his troops, some six legions of men. Hearing that Marius had been appointed by a vote of the Senate, he suborned his troops, summoned his troops, I should say. He called on them to free Rome from tyrants. And he called on them to support his own honor. No doubt he made them promises of rewards, should they do so. And despite the fact that all but one senior officer uh, disagreed with the action and refused to participate, everyone of the rank and file followed. Sulla turned the army again, uh, assigned to him by the Senate of Rome back now on his native country. It took him several days to reach Rome. And delegations continually came out again and again from the city to calm down the situation. Repeatedly, they asked Scylla, why are you doing this? What, are, what do you want? Why are you turning an army of Roman people against the Roman people? Scylla's response is very illustrative. To free her from tyrants, he said. In his mind, he was posing as a liberator. He was doing something honorable something to save the libertas of the Roman state, even as he was setting an example that would ultimately ensure the destruction of that state and its transformation, its reversion back into a monarchy. This is a very interesting illustration of the way that the mind of the main protagonist of the Roman revolution could operate. Scylla's troops arrived in Rome and were, were not well greeted by the populace. They were not looked at as liberators, they were pelted with dung, in fact, and tiles from the balconies and roofs of the city. Marius and Sulpicius had rustled up whatever fortunes they could in the city, and open warfare took place in the very heart of the Roman Empire, in the Roman Forum itself, and on the hills, and in the streets neighboring the Forum, open battles between Roman soldiers. In all of this mayhem, Sulla was victorious. Sulpicius, uh, Rufus, the tribune that Marius had used was hunted down and murdered, and Marius fled. Uh, it's interesting to, to note that Marius's flight from Rome, which lasted the best part of several months, is presented in our sources, especially Plutarch, in a very kind of Spielbergian sort of way. It's very dramatic. He's constantly running away with Scylla's cavalry at his heels, hiding in marshes and in caves and people's barns and in their back gardens, trying to get away from his pursuers. 
He finally makes his way over to Africa, where many of his veterans from the Jugurthine War had been located, and he found safety there. This was like a power base for him. Having dr driven Marius out of Rome, Sulla settled the affairs of the city as best he could, put a bounty on Marius's head as a public enemy, of course, and went off east to fight Mithridates as he was initially supposed to do. Sulla then, in capturing Rome and trying to reinforce uh, or preserve that traditional government of Rome, which had given him the command to begin with, in fact, carried out the single most revolutionary act in the Roman Revolution, um, because he turned, he, he actually initiated a civil war of, of sorts. And with this precedent now on the books, with this new boundary of behavior having been breached, the floodgates were wide open and the possibilities for mayhem and violence in the future were virtually limitless. Marius, once Sulla had left for the east, returned to Italy from Africa with supporters from Africa, and he was joined by another figure, a rebel consul named Lucius Cornelius Cinna, the, the usual way to anglicize that is to say Cinna. Lucius Cornelius Cinna joined, joined forces at this point with Marius, and uh, together they marched their forces on Rome in the year 87 BC. They captured the city and apparently wrought a dreadful vengeance, uh, wreaked a dreadful vengeance on all those who had supported Sulla's action in the previous year. Marius appointed himself consul now for the seventh time in the year 86 BC. However, he died within a month of taking office. However, with the death of Marius, Marius's supporters and those of Cinna did not just evaporate, so what we have now is a rather odd situation where Sulla is at the head of a Roman army fighting a foreign head of Rome, Mithridates, in Asia, in control, uh, uh, but, but in control of the city is, uh, are his political opponents. The situation gets somewhat ludicrous because the Sinan controlled government of Rome refuses to accept the fact that there is this Roman army in the field and sends out its own army to fight Mithridates in Asia. The two Roman armies in Asia spend as much time fighting each other as they do fighting Mithridates, and the whole situation becomes virtually comic. Sulla, however, is very keen to get back to Italy and to resolve the situation with his political opponents, and so he doesn't actually defeat Mithridates. He concludes a somewhat disgraceful and rushed peace with Mithridates in the year 85. The king doesn't really suffer any punishment, certainly nothing commensurate for the mass slaughter of Romans and Italians at the Asiatic Vespers. And Sulla brings his army home to Italy in 84 BC or 83 BC, sometime over that winter. Uh, normally the event is dated to 83 BC. Cinna's control of Rome was relatively moderate. Um, it was an autocracy of sorts to be sure, but uh, you know, in the fact that he simply appointed himself consul and nominated colleagues, no elections were held, but it was relatively moderate. It, it is not as if Cinna was a violent tyrant in the city. He was a political opponent of Sulla and there could be little doubt what was to happen when Sulla brought his men back to Italy, but Cinna himself was, was moderate. He was nevertheless, though, killed by his own troops in a mutiny in 84 BC while trying to get at uh, and oppose Sulla across the Adriatic in the, in the area of Dalmatia. The troops mutinied against him and killed him, but the supporters of Marius and Cinna continued to resist uh, and they, uh, in Rome, and they raised what troops they could. And therefore, when Sulla landed in Italy in 83 BC, all out war broke out in Italy between the supporters of Marius and Cinna and Sulla, Marius and Cinna on the one side and Sulla on the other and his troops from the east. The war lasted a year and a half. It was a brutal and vicious uh, war as all civil wars tend to be, but it left Sulla ultimately in control uh, of Rome and of Italy. But what happened next marks in many ways some of the darkest pages of our story. Sulla entered Rome, bringing with him several thousand prisoners, Samnite prisoners who had fought against him. 
Uh, the Samnites, remember, had fought against Sulla in the social war and did not like him personally. So they naturally flocked to the banners of his opponents. Well, he brought these Samnites into the city and grouped them together in the Circus Maximus, which is the great chariot racing arena in Rome. Nothing to do with circus in our sense of the word. He then convened a meeting of the Senate in a nearby temple. As the Senate convened on a given command, all of the prisoners, some 3,000 of them, were slaughtered in the Circus Maximus. You can imagine the sound of that. A tumultuous noise emanated from this heinous event, and one of the senators inquired, what is that noise? Scylla responded coldly, some enemies of the state are receiving their just punishment. No one could be in any doubt as to what awaited the enemies of Scylla, now classified as enemies of the state. And it is worth reading several protracted passages from Plutarch's Life of Scylla to illustrate what happened next. Plutarch writes, Scylla now devoted himself entirely to the work of butchery. The city was filled with murder, and there was no counting the executions or setting a limit to them. Many people were killed because of personal ill feeling. They had no connection with Scylla in any way, but Scylla, in order to gratify members of his own party, permitted them to be done away with. Finally, one of the younger men, Gaius Metellus, ventured to ask Scylla in the Senate at what point this terrible state of affairs was to end, and how much further would he proceed before they could expect a cessation of what was now going on? We are not asking you, he said, to pardon those you have decided to kill. All we ask is that you should free from suspense those whom you have decided not to kill. Scylla replied that he was not yet sure whom he should spare. Metellus at once said, then let us know whom you intend to punish. Scylla said that he would do this. Then immediately, and without consulting any magistrate, Scylla published a list of 80 men to be condemned. Now, I will just intercede here at this moment and note that these lists, which were posted in the forum in a public spot, uh, give the name. They're in, in Latin, they're called proscriptiones, things that have been, writings that have been posted up is what that means. And so th th this, this procedure of putting out lists of men to be killed are, get their name from these lists, uh, proscriptiones, they're called proscriptions, okay? Writing up in a public space uh, of a name. To return now to Plutarch's narrative, public opinion was horrified, but after a single day's interval, he published another list containing 220 more names. And the next day, a third list with the same number of names on it. In a public speech, which he made on the subject, he said that he was publishing the names of all those whom he happened to remember. Those who escaped his memory for the moment would have to have their names put up in due course. He also condemned anyone who sheltered or attempted to save anyone Whose, names, whose name was on the list. Death was the penalty for such acts of humanity, and there were no exceptions in the case of brothers, sons, or parents. On the other hand, the reward for murder was two talents. This sum was paid to anyone who killed a condemned man, even though it was a slave who killed his master or a son, his father. In other words, again to briefly intercede here. The proscriptions said it was open season on those who were prescribed. Also, and this was regarded as one of the greatest injustices of all, Plutarch says, Sulla took away all civil rights from the sons and grandsons of those who had been proscribed and confiscated the property of all. Moreover, proscriptions were made not only in Rome, but also in every city of Italy. And neither temple of God nor hearth of hospitality nor paternal home was free from the stain of bloodshed. But husbands were butchered in, their, in the embraces of their wedded wives and sons in the arms of their mothers. Those who fell victims to political resentment and private hatred were as nothing compared with those who were butchered for the sake of their property. Nay, even the executioners were prompted to say that this great house killed this man, his garden that man his warm baths another. 
Quintus Aurelius, a quiet and inoffensive man who thought his only share in the general calamity was to condole, that is, to be sympathetic with others in their misfortunes, came down into the forum and read the list of the, of the prescribed, and finding his own name there, said, Ah, woe is me, my Alban estate is, pros is prosecuting me. And he had not gone far before he was dispatched by someone who had hunted him down. Such is Plutarch's description of the proscriptions. Thousands perished in these purges. Their property was confiscated and auctioned off at knockdown prices to friends of Scylla and the Forum. The heads of those who were executed were hung from the speaker's platform in the Forum or displayed on spikes around it. This process went on for the best part of a year, and sometime during it, Scylla decided to legitimize his position and settle the affairs of the state. And so he resurrected in the year 82 or perhaps 81 BC, the ancient office of dictator, dictator, which had been out of favor since the end of the Second Punic War. This office was by tradition to be held by one individual for a six month period of time, you remember, to carry out a special task, that a specific, specific task that would be listed in the title of the dictatorship. So, so his dictatorship had the novel title in Latin of Dictator Legibus Scribundis et Rei Publicae Constituendi. If you didn't quite get that, uh, it is he declared himself dictator for writing of laws and organizing the state. That is basically he was dictator over everything. No specific task. What is more, other than holding the office for six months. Sulla was to hold the office for as long as he saw, saw fit. With these powers, therefore, he began to redraft the government of Rome. Now, Sulla's reforms, his legislations, issued in the form of dictatorial decrees that were not open to question or veto, can be described as reactionary. Okay? If the other side is revolutionary, then he is very much a reactionary. He intended to turn back the clock on the revolution. He intended to turn back the clock on the rise of the populares. And therefore, he issued a series of laws that muzzled the tribunate. He really saw the tribunate as the source of all of these problems. And so he issued a series of laws that muzzled the tribunate and restricted the rights of the tribal assembly of the plebs. Some examples of these decrees would be that tribunes could not propose legislation to the tribal assembly of the plebs. Any legislation that was to be proposed had to be passed by the Senate. The Senate, for its part, was given the right of vetoing plebiscites, that is, decisions of the tribal assembly of the plebs, as a disincentive to the young, you know, ambitious nobleman to stand for the office of tribunate. Sulla decreed that anyone who had been a tribune ever could not stand for any further office in the Roman cursus honorum. Effectively, if you wanted to stand for the tribunate, that would be the beginning and the end of your political career. So that's one half, one very important part of Sulla's legislative program. It was an attempt to turn back the clock on the rise of the popularis movement and the rise of the movement of tribunes and the tribal assembly of the plebs as a major power in politics. But he also, there was another half to it. He reformed the Senate too expelling many uh, of its members and installing newcomers who you won't be surprised to know uh, were supporters of Sulla. The Senate now reached very high numbers, maybe 1,000, uh, much higher than it ever would be before or after. And as a result, these were, these men were, these ranks were staffed overwhelmingly by Sulla's supporters. The demographics of the body changed considerably. He also introduced various laws that we don't have to look at in detail, he effectively tried to prevent any army commanders in the provinces from doing what he himself had done in turning their armies against their native state. In addition to his various politically motivated laws and regulations, Sulla also instituted several laws that were very sensible in nature and indeed stood long after his death and became a regular part of the Roman state. Uh, for instance, he was the first one to establish permanent standing courts, quaestiones is the word in Latin, 
up to that time, courts had been ad hoc, but Sola now established a series of courts to deal with cases of violence, murder, poisoning, embezzlement, forgery, and so forth. And uh, these would, would be standing courts staffed by senators, not equestrians, and which survived long after his own death. He also instituted alterations in the cursus honorum. Uh, he in increased, for instance, the number of some magistracies and stiffened the age limits for others, for candidates for the various offices in the Roman system of office holder. Under Sulla, the process of evolution that, were, that I described uh, when looking at the Roman system of government continued, therefore. Um, it, it wasn't as if it ever really stopped. It certainly didn't stop with Sulla. Uh, in 50, 79 BC, perhaps two and a half or perhaps three years into his dictatorship, Sulla did a remarkable thing. He reckoned that his job was done. And remarkably, something that no, nobody predicted, he resigned his dictatorship and retired to private life. If we are to believe our sources, he spent the rest of his life indulging in an oppressive litany of sexual perversions until he finally died in the year 78 BC, uh, but by all accounts, peacefully in his bed. Well, Sulla's career is in many ways emblematic of the stage that the Roman Revolution had reached at this point and the direction that Roman politics was now taking. As a person, Solo is an intriguing figure, given to bouts of lethargy, but also great periods of action, a sort of odd mix of mediocrity and brilliance, placidity and downright savagery. He could forgive people as easily as he could condemn them. Some in the 20th century have regarded him and tried to make a case for him as a sociopath. That is certainly quite possible, although such psychiatric diagnoses of this distance and, and time are impossible. Basically, what a sociopath is, is somebody who is not mentally ill in the sense of hearing voices or having some kind of, you know, like schizophrenia or something like that. A sociopath is somebody who, for some reason or other, in their childhood, their conscience has not really formed. And uh, if you, if you, I, I would recommend actually everybody uh, taking a look at, you can just go onto YouTube and see like characteristics of a sociopath. It is estimated that 10% of our, of the population out there are sociopaths. And they tend to be people who get involved in politics. They tend to be people who rise very high in corporations, oftentimes very charming people, people who, uh, uh, you know, people like a lot on a, on a kind of superficial level. But inwardly, they have no real human feelings. They don't feel the same sorts of things, neither gratitude, nor remorse, nor love, nor anything. And so they feel tremendous boredom, oftentimes, because life is so, it's like not having the ability to taste food or something like that. It's just, you know, you, and so to, to get themselves to feel anything at all, they resort to manipulating people and, and causing great pain to people. Uh, and that somehow does something for them. So it is certainly possible that he had that quality to him. Um, his career is best illustrated by his response, I think, to those delegations coming out of Rome as he turned his army on the city in 88 BC. It is because I think they're so very Ill illustrative of the way that the Roman revolution worked. Here we have a man doing this incredibly revolutionary thing, and yet, he knowingly uh, you know, enlists the loyalty of his troops and turn them against his own native country. But he justifies it in doing, justifies doing this by saying that he is restoring liberty and taking his country back from the hands of tyrants, okay? And we will see this justification, you know, and he, that he has the full authority of the Senate behind him and he's freeing Rome from these upstart populares. We will see this justification used again and again by revolutionaries who used their own armies against Rome. They are only free in Rome against tyrants. He felt himself bound by necessity and by the need to maintain the liberty of the state to carry out this revolutionary act. He reacted to, the, to circumstances as he saw fit uh, at, at, at any given moment. Sulla's vision was a narrow one. He only looked to the immediate circumstances that he faced, and in so doing, 
he set a precedent that was to be horribly abused in future years. We see it within a matter of months, in fact, of his death. Uh, more on that tomorrow. Uh, he also had a very narrow vision when it came to dealing with the problems of the state. We see that his program of legislation uh, was essentially a reactionary one. He wanted to set the clock back and restore the authority of the Senate through dictatorial legislation. We see that this approach was absolutely doomed to failure. Setting the clock back is not always the best approach to dealing with new problems, either in your personal life or in the state. And certainly in Sulla's case, it was doomed to failure. You know, it's kind of like, you know, I'm sure most of you have had the experience at some point in your life of being wrapped up in a toxic relationship. And, you know, it's very bad and very painful. And finally, when it's all over, you just think to yourself, okay, I'm just going to just gonna go back to the way it was last year, or just going to go back to the way it was five years ago, or whatever the case may be. But of course, that's impossible. You've changed since then. The, the, the world around you has changed. You know, you can never just turn the clock back. And the tribunate uh, and the tribal assembly of the plebs, in this particular instance, were simply too useful a tool to be left in abeyance for long. So within a decade of Sulla's death, all of his legislation would ultimately be totally undone, washed away, and the Roman Revolution would gear up for its final and bloodiest generation, as we will see in future lectures. Uh, another one of Sulla's absolutely worst precedents was the mass execution through proscriptions of his opponents. This is taking the mob rule that we have seen already used by tribunes to whole new heights or depths. Uh, this is not an occasional riot. This is not even a planned assassination of an individual who spoke against you. This is, uh, is not even going around with body, uh, armed bodyguards to protect you or to use as hired thugs, as, as, as bad as that may be against one's opponents. This is now... Uh, uh, and in fact, there would be actually one tribune of this era who would, who used to go around with a hired gang of ruffians that he called his anti-Senate, uh, which I think is a good illustration of the way that the populares thought. You know, imagine Nancy Pelosi hiring the Bloods, you know, to uh, to attack Mitch McConnell's Crips on site, you know, and then having them shoot out at each other in the midst of Washington D.C. It's kind of like what we're talking about here. Um, but the point though is that. The proscriptions mark something much more than all of this. This is the systematic organized hunting down of one's political opponents, not just in Rome, but all across Italy in a state-sponsored purge of all political opponents uh, as public enemies. And this we will see was a feature of the revolution that was to resurrect itself in the years following the assassination of Julius Caesar. You put it all together then in conclusion, the career of Sulla is a rather harrowing one. And it brings us closer to the ultimate shape of the Roman Revolution, which will manifest itself in the 60s BC and the 50s BC and the 40s BC, with the rise to power of such men as Gnaeus Pompeius, Pompey the Great, and Gaius Julius Caesar, and the man who was to prove the best player, in a sense, at this game, and to set the Roman state in many ways on a new course. He would be the only man who came to the revolution sober, as one of his political detractors put it. Uh, that will all be, though, of course, the subject of our future lectures. But for the next time, I just want to focus, uh, we'll introduce our next lecture specifically on the decade of the 70s and the gradual process of unraveling uh, of Sulla's attempted restoration, um, as it is often called. And uh, uh, I will just leave you with one last kind of word about Sulla, uh, his tombstone in some ways kind of sums up his character, I think, very well. Uh, he put, he's, on, on his tombstone, it says, here lies Sulla. There never was a friend who helped me, nor an enemy who wronged me, whom I have not repaid in full. And that indeed is, uh, I think, sums up the, the nature of his personality very well. Thank you very much. <laughs>